The stars at night are big and bright. Big in the heart of Texas. <laughs> no, not that, Pee Wee. This adventure belongs to Calgary Stampeder wide receiver Pee Wee Schmidt. Tonight, Pee Wee and the Stamps make their first trip to the Lone Star State to take on the San Antonio Texans. <laughs> as always, are led by Doug Flutie and his tandem of superb slot backs, Alan Pitts, who scored a CFL record 21 touchdowns last year, and Dave Sapungin, who, along with Pitts, is on course to gain 2,000 yards this season. The Texans will counter with one of the CFL's leading rushers in Mike Saunders. The job of stopping Saunders will be given to Calgary's superb linebackers, Captain Matt Finley, Big Daddy Marvin Pope, and newcomer Anthony McClanahan. CFL Live. Today's game from the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. The Calgary Stampeders versus the San Antonio Texans. Good afternoon and welcome to the CFL on TSN. I'm Darren Detitian. We're glad you tuned in today for the Calgary Stampeders and the San Antonio Texans. You know their season to date has been perfect. At 6-0, Calgary has clearly been the class of the CFL, while at 4-3, the so-called expansion San Antonio Texans have been more than respectable considering their latest crisis. Last week, David Archer did not play due to a groin pull, but today he returns to the starting position. He will be backed up by Jim Kemp, who is in turn followed by that ageless wonder and former NFLer Joe Ferguson. Now even their kicker, Josh Miller, could quarterback if need be. There is no such quarterbacking problems in Calgary. Doug Flutie is once again having another MVP season. With more on the stamps, and they're very formidable offense. Let's go to Gord Miller and Glenn Suter in San Antonio. Here they go again, Glenn. The Calgary Stampeders are 6-0, and coming off back-to-back 15-3 -back seasons. And once again, the question is in the CFL, can anybody stop these guys? Well, they're awfully tough. You know, they have Doug Flutie and the number one and two receivers in the league and Dave Sapungis and Alan Pitts. And on defense, allowing the fewest points in the league. So they're awful tough, but they can be beaten. The way you do it is keep that offense off the field. Now, San Antonio has just the guy to do it. A former teammate of yours, Mike Saunders, signed as a free agent just when the season began. He's the CFL's second-leading rusher. Yeah, and Talking to a lot of the coaches around the CFL, they say that this guy is the most underrated running back in the Canadian Football League. He does it all. Catches the ball well out of the backfield and is great on those draw plays. As amazing as 6-0 is for the Calgary Stampeders, how about 12-0? That's the Stamps' record against U.S.-based teams in the Canadian Football League. Darren? Thanks very much, gentlemen. On now to our game story. It's made up of the elements that we think will dictate this contest one way or the other. You know, they really have to contain Doug Flutie and pressure him if possible. With the appropriate amount of time, he will pick you apart. I mean, come on, he's already thrown for over 2,200 yards. Sometimes the best defense is a good offense. David Archer returns to the starting role. He's got to put some points on the board and keep Doug Flutie off the field. Mike Saunders, the second leading rusher in the CFL, with his 5.2 yards per carry average, has to have a big game. But can he run against the big daddy? Marvin Pope. Meanwhile, the super slot backs, Dave Sapungis and Alan Pitts, both guys are on pace to go over 2,000 yards in reception. Texas is going to have a tough time with them. Time now so from football as we go back to the Alamo Dome for the opening kickoff. Gentlemen. Thanks very much, Darren. We're in the great indoors, and a good thing, too, because it's pouring rain in San Antonio today. The remnants of a weather system that came through after a hurricane hit the Mexican coast. Wally Buono has never lost to a U.S.-based team. It's his fifth meeting uh, against Kay Stevenson. And Kay, 19, 23 and 1 in his CFL coaching career in his third year with this franchise. Roman Anderson will kick it off. Terry Vaughn and Pee Wee Smith are back deep to receive for the Calgary Stampeders. And we are underway at the Alamo 
Thibodeau. Pee Wee Smith from the 20 yard line. And Smith trying to get outside. He does. He's got room up the sideline, but steps back inside. He got whacked down there. A 55 yard kickoff, a return of seven. The four time CFL MVP is on pace for 6,700 yards passing. Doug Flutie already has 2,200 yards to lead all CFL quarterbacks this year. The starting lineups brought to you by Mr. Sub. Fresh thinking is what we are. Three of these five offensive linemen used to play for the BC Lions, and four of them were drafted in the same year. And the receiving core features Alan Pitts and Dave Sapungis. Sapungis is number one in CFL receiving. Pitts is number two. And Calgary right away goes to the six-pack. Four receivers. They set up to Vince Danielson and Danielson to throw to Pitts. And Pitts dropped the football right at the 50-yard line. Now, the San Antonio Texans quite likely not aware of the fact that Danielson was a quarterback in college. Yeah, Wally Bono thinks he's a great athlete, and he used to play quarterback, so this is a perfect play to run early in the game, but a good job by Franks coming across to the middle from the free safety position to help out because the ball hangs up there a little bit. Franks come over and puts a hit on Alan Pitts to knock the ball out of there, but a little razzle-dazzle for Calgary early in this football game. Now, second and ten for Flutie and the Stampeder. Three receivers to each side, and Flutie looks to the middle, and it's behind Vince Danielson, the closest man in the football, was the corner, Malcolm Frank, so it's two and out for the CFL's number one offense. And Tony Martino is in to punt, probably the earliest he's ever had to punt in the game this year. <laughs> we were joking with Tony Martino earlier in the before the game about the fact that he hasn't had a lot of punts, but that's the way the Calgary Stampeders like it. If they're not punting, that means they're either putting in the field goals or putting the ball in the end zone. Marcus Gates is back deep to receive, along with David Lucas, the former Shreveport Pirate. This is Lucas from the 48. And not much further. He got stacked up quickly. Thrown down a play by Raymond Biggs, the backup linebacker. A 34-yard punt by Martino, a return of three. David Archer has been hobbled by a hamstring injury. And so as a result, he'll give way to back up Jimmy Kemp. And we may see Archer later in the day. So it is Jimmy Kemp, the 23-year-old, out of Wake Forest, who directs the attack for the San Antonio Texans. Under 50% he is, two touchdowns, seven interceptions this year, and right away, he goes to the shotgun. A fake to the fullback, and Kemp goes out to the far side, and the pass incomplete there. He was looking for number 32, Mike Saunders, so Jim Kemp, the son of Jack Kemp, but there's an amazing story that relates to Joe Ferguson that we'll tell you a little bit later. He starts a quarterback, and along the offensive line, Mike Kislak has been with this San Antonio Sacramento franchise since the beginning. The incompletion brings up second and ten for Kemp and the Texans. And once again, the San Antonio quarterback goes to the shotgun. Kemp, lots of time over the middle. And close to the first down was Billy Hess. But he'll come up a few yards short. It'll be a punting situation for the San Antonio Texans. But it really was the read that Kemp wanted to go to. Coming over the middle, the Calgary Stampeders had his own defense. The linebackers had dropped off, and Matt Finley and Alondra Johnson. So Kemp did what he had to, and that stumped the ball to the back underneath the coverage and hoped that the back could get the first down for him. Fortunately for San Antonio, it didn't happen. Todd Jordan on the putt now for San Antonio. And once again, Pee Wee Smith and Terry Vaughn are back deep. Smith had a punt return for a touchdown called back last week. There's Vaughn from the 10. Vaughn gets by the first wave. Terry Vaughn finally gets out to the 22-yard line. There is a flag down on the play. He was tripped up by number 96, Oscar Giles, a 44-yard punt. And a good job by Vaughn to return at 12. John D. Jake Ireland, the pride of Townsend, Ontario, is our referee today. Illegal block, Calgary number 95, first down. 
Mark Pierce is called for an illegal block, and that will be a costly penalty for the Calgary Stampeders. Instead of starting at their own 22, they're now backed up to their own seven. It is pretty amazing that they got that penalty because it didn't look like Terry Vaughn had a whole lot of help on that punt return. He beat, made a couple of guys miss by himself, but it didn't look like he had much help in blocking, and they got the penalty anyway. Flutie second series, and he lines up under center. And it gives to the fullback, Sean Daniels, out across the 10 to the 11-yard line. A gain of five for the Calgary fullback. The San Antonio defense is led by linebacker Dave Harper, whose 39 tackles are second best in the Canadian Football League, and it's a veteran secondary. Four of the five in the defensive secondary have at least three years' experience in the Canadian Football League. Now Flutie back to the shotgun on second down. Lots of time. Got Danielson over the middle. Danielson has a first down all the way back to where Vaughn originally returned the punt. He stopped at the 22-yard line. First completion of the game for Doug Flutie. Yeah, straight man-to-man -man defense from San Antonio. And Flutie's going to look off the safety and then come back across the middle where he had the pick. Throw that one in there and... To get the man-to-man, -man, you're going to see a lot of picks coming from Calgary, especially when they spread those wide receivers out to get three on each side, and it's tough to pick up your man when you're trying to run through traffic as a defensive back. The game was 11, and now the toss goes out to Terry Vaughn. And he is stopped very quickly on the play by Roosevelt Collins, who played his college football at TCU. And he also got some help on the play by... Dave Harper, this team's leading tackler. Good team speed by Collins. He's going to come across and hit Terry Vaughn, and good speed to get out there, and good mobility for a big man. And what was unusual about that play was that Terry Vaughn, a wide receiver, lined up at halfback on the play for Calgary. Now on second down, after the loss of a yard, here's Flutie. Over the middle, wide open is Tony Stewart, but the pass was a little too high. Stewart Hutt got in behind linebacker Leonard Nelson, but he couldn't squeeze that pass. It'll bring up third down for Calgary, and the Stamps are sluggish getting started. Yeah, and the, one of the keys to that play was Charles Franks from the safety position was influenced by Dave Sapunges. Now Flutie's going to take the ball out of the shotgun and look to Sapunges down the middle. That takes a free safety out and allows Stewart to get so wide open in behind the linebackers. <laughs> Doug Flutie knows he had one there and just couldn't get the ball to Stewart. And Tony Martino will punt for the second time. Tony Martino. Lucas and Gates are back deep to receive. High snap. Martino just gets it down and gets a tumbling kick away to Gates at the 50. And he goes out of bounds there. So the San Antonio Texans will start in Calgary territory after a 30-yard punt by Tony Martino. No score in San Antonio. Do you remember your first Pepsi? 1926 at Homer's General Store. Pepsi number two, cheap seats, Wrigley Field. Pepsi 812, the stock market crash. Pepsi 3922, spam was invented. 14,030, your dad repeated third grade. And this is Pepsi 21,004, Kathy. Kelly. Kelly? Kelly. I knew that. I think I knew that. I shopped around a lot, and uh, the Honda Accord was one of the cars that I looked at, but I fell in love with the Ford Contour because uh, it's exhilarating to drive. When I say to my family and friends, ooh, it's got a Duratec engine, everybody's like, oh, really? The best kind of driving would be bright sunshine to somewhere fun. With the Contour, it's like, oh, it's only an hour and a half. CFL Live on TSN, brought to you by All Sport, the new All Sport drink for athletes. All Sport, the game will never be the same. And by Bell Advantage Long Distance Services, from the Alliance of Canada's only full-service telecommunications companies. The Alamo, and Wally Plato with some of his Calgary players got over there to take a look at it yesterday. San Antonio, one of the more scenic cities you'll find in the United States, with a beautiful river walk here, and of course, the historic Alamo and Wally Buono, a student of history, was anxious to get over and take a look at that when he had some time yesterday. 
What about the winning percentage for Wally Buono? 73%. Number three all time in the CFL. I mean, this guy knows how to win. It's amazing to think where the Calgary Stampeders were when he took over. Here at San Antonio, first and ten from the Calgary 50-yard line, and Kemp in the shotgun on first down. And it's a handoff to Mike Saunders. Saunders tries to bull his way through the middle. Not much doing there. It's a gain of perhaps a yard as he ran into a wall of Calgary Stampeders that included Sreko Zizakovic and Alondra Johnson. But the addition of Mike Saunders has been a big one for the San Antonio Texans. He has accounted for two-thirds of San Antonio's rushing yards this year. And you wonder why the Saskatchewan Rough Riders are struggling? Because that guy's wearing a different uniform. That's why. He had above 3,000 yards, 1,200 on the ground for Saskatchewan last year and had left that team as a free agent joining San Antonio. And that's the reason that Saskatchewan is struggling. Just a gain of a yard on that last carry. It brings up second and nine. And here comes the rush. Kemp's in trouble and he's lost the football. Stu Laird picks it up. After Alondra Johnson forced the fumble. Alondra Johnson got in to knock it loose, and Stu Laird recovers the fumble, and the Calgary Stampeders forced the first turnover of the game, and San Antonio has its league-leading 15th fumble of the year. And you'll see, Stu, uh, you'll see Alondra Johnson coming right through the middle on the blitz and getting the pressure on Kemp, and no one blocks Alondra Johnson. And with a guy with that kind of ability, you got to at least get try and get a piece of Johnson coming through. But the blitz confuses the San Antonio offensive line. Alondra Johnson coming in and causing that fumble for the first turnover of the game. Well, thanks to the Calgary defense, Doug Flutie and the offense get their first trip into San Antonio territory as they begin at the Texans' 38-yard line. Still no score at the Alamo Dome. Flutie with a fake to Stewart. Wants to go deep. Has a man over the middle. So comes it, and there's a flag down on the play. Tom Gerhardt, the linebacker, was covering Sapunjas. And it looks like he got in there a little too soon. Now, Tom Gearhart is the is the kind of the in-between defensive back linebacker type of guy. Six foot one ninety-seven. San Antonio number 45. First down. And it is pass interference on Tom Gerhardt. It's and, a 24-yard penalty. Sorry, Gary. They believe that this guy can cover Dave Sapunjas, and they'll be in that matchup a lot during the year. But what happened was Gerhardt put his hand up before the ball got there and screened Sapunjas. That was the call. First and 10 from the 14. Early movement. Flutie fakes to Stewart. Shovel up the middle to Daniel. Sean Daniel close to the end zone. Stop at the 1. What a great call by the Calgary Stampeders. A guy that you're not expecting in this kind of, this is called the red zone, inside the 20-yard line. When Calgary's down here, they usually go to Tony Stewart or Alan Pitts. This time, they dump it off on the shovel to Daniels coming up the middle, and when you get that kind of weight going forward, it's awful tough to, to bring him down as a defensive back. He wanted that one to score. Doug Flutie wanted that one in the end zone. But a good play call by the Calgary Stampeders. As it is, a gain of 13 yards. It's a first down for the Stampeders at the San Antonio one-yard line. Now three backs in the backfield. Flutie. The give to Daniels. The end zone. Touchdown, Calgary. So the Stampeders make the Texans pay for the fumble and the pass interference penalty. Sean Daniels gets his second rushing touchdown of the season. They call it sudden change. When there's a quick turnover, offensively, you want to take advantage of it. It gets that momentum going for your football team. And Sean Daniels gets those shoulders down and him weighing in at 234 pounds. Boy, it's tough for a defensive back to bring him down. That's a pretty easy touchdown for Daniels. Coming off the right side of the line with former all-star Rocco Romano blocking for him. Big touchdown for Calgary. And now Mark McLaughlin will try to make his 300th consecutive point after. Which he does. And the Calgary Stampeders are on the board first, leading San Antonio 7-0 on the CFL Live, deep in the heart of Texas. As an adult, I insist on a cereal that offers nutrition. 
And I can't deny that part of me desires frosting. I want frosting. My cereal is low in fat. And taste. What about taste? Relax. With Kellogg's Mini Wheat Cereal, you can have it both ways. For the adult in you, whole grain wheat, low in fat and no added salt. For the kid in you, lightly frosted, great taste. I know it goes on my tray. The sweet stuff. Tonight's event is brought to you in part by Trojan Condoms. Face it, shaving is a pain. It strips away the skin's moisture, leaving it hot, dry, and burning. But now there's Sensitive from Old Spice. It's the one with cooling sensates, an invigorating blast of real refreshment that takes the heat out of shaving. One of five Montreal natives on the Calgary roster, Sean Daniels gets his second rushing touchdown of the season thanks to some help from a defensive player. Yeah, right here is Marvin Pope at 253 pounds, comes in on that short yardage play. Watch him lead it up for Sean Daniels on the run. 253. If you're a defensive back, you want to get a piece of that? I don't think so. <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> Well, it's a familiar story for San Antonio. Turning the ball over cost them. Marcus Gates and David Lucas are back now for the kickoff from McLaughlin. From the 15, this is David Lucas. And Lucas gets up to the 26-yard line before he stopped on a play by one of the newcomers, Anthony McClanahan. A 59-yard kickoff, a return of 15. The forward scoring drive, well, it was all set up by the fumble from Jim Kemp, which was picked up by Stu Laird. Add that to a 24-yard pass interference penalty, and you've got Sean Daniels in from the one-yard line. So Jim Kemp has the first turnover of the football game, the 15th time this year that San Antonio has lost a fumble. Yeah, they're minus 14. Worst in the CFL. They definitely have to change that. Starting now from their own 26-yard line, and here's San Antonio's version of the shovel pass. And there's Calgary's way to defend it. Put big Kenny Walker in there with Sreko Zizakovic, and nothing doing there for Mike Saunders. <laughs> well, Mike Saunders received the ball, and you'll see number 96, Sreko Zizakovic, get good penetration and stand right there. Mike Saunders had nowhere to go. He caught it, turned around, and big Dreko standing right there. Sreko almost caught that himself. His brother Lubo is not in the lineup tonight, so Sreko has the Zizakovic banner to carry by himself. Second and ten now, and Kemp. This time he has time. Out to the flat he goes. It's to the fullback, Tony Burst, and Burst is well short of the first down as he gets up to the 35-yard line. He comes up seven yards short. Yeah, and what happens here again is Calgary defensively is going to make Kemp read the defense. They're going to play a lot of zone on Kemp to see if he can read it. And they're going to, they love for this to happen. Dump it off on second and long and hope that someone can uh, break a tackle for 10 yards. Gerald Vaughn will not have it broken on him. And it's tough to make that open field tackle, but, you know, Calgary was all over that football. And they'll love it if they just dump the ball out in the flat like that throughout this game. Dodd Jordan back to punt for the second time. Almost had that blocked. Here's Jerry Vaughn for the 44. And San Antonio down quickly to stop his progress. There is a flag on the play. And it came from well behind where he caught it. So this may not be no yards, although it looked pretty close. A 34-yard punt that time by Todd Jordan. Illegal block against Calgary. So once again, a penalty on a return will set the Stampeders back. Now you can tell from where the flag came from, it was back in the backfield. And it looked like it was in the back. Illegal block, Calgary number 31, first down. Roger Reinson has called for the illegal block on the punt that almost didn't happen. Greg, Greg Fears almost makes the tackle. He's the backup free safety, but a big part of the special teams for the Calgary Stampeders. He almost blocks that kick. First and 10 for Flutie and the Stampeders from their own 34-yard line. Again, it's Daniels with the carry. Daniels gets a couple on the play as he is stopped by Willie Fears and George Bethune. Sean Daniels is one of five players in this team from Montreal. As I mentioned, Wally Buono, of course, spent a lot of time there as a player and an assistant coach, but he says it's just coincidence. <laughs> yeah, coaches always bring in their own boys, the guys they're familiar with. And you see him talking there on the left to John Huffnagel, the offensive coordinator for the Calgary Stampeders. 
including giving John Huffnagel a lion's share of the praise for this Calgary Stampeder offense. 21, 21. Now on second and seven, Flutie over the middle for Vince Danielson. He's close to a first down as he gets up to the 43, but he needed the 44, so the Stamps will be just short. Or will they be? Got a pretty generous spot, so if they are short, it will only be by inches. Now, from a defensive standpoint, if you're San Antonio, I talked to Mark Nelson. He says what they want to do is not necessarily try and get tremendous pressure on Flutie, but try and just squeeze him into the pocket and try and eliminate those throwing lanes that Flutie always seems to find. Calgary will oftentimes spread out that offensive line, get their tackles in real wide splits, and then try and get the one-on-one -on -one so that Flutie goes the opposite way the defensive lineman does. What San Antonio wants to do is narrow down that pocket and keep him in there. Of course, it's been the book on Doug Flutie since he, since he came into the Canadian Football League. Basically, if you can make him throw from the pocket, you can beat him. It hasn't worked. No, it hasn't. I mean, he can throw from the pocket, and he can get the ball down the field from there. But what they want to do, San Antonio does, is just to get the pocket squeezed and eliminate the lanes, but also get your hands up. Doug Flutie's not a tall guy, and they want to try and make him throw over the upstretched hands. Well, a long yard to go, a little too rich for Wally Buono's butt, so Tony Martino will come out to punt. And Tony Martino for the third time tonight. Remember, we did a game against BC a couple weeks ago where he didn't punt for the first time until the second half. And 11 men up now for San Antonio as David Lucas is the lone returner back. Lots of time for Martino, who's trying to get it away from Lucas. Here's Lucas from the 28. He's got some room. The flag is down, and so is Lucas up to the 43-yard line. Kevin Reed came up to make the stop. A 39-yard punt, a return of 11. Calgary leads San Antonio 7-0. Back with four on the CFL Live in just a moment. Car and Driver has chosen their 10 best automobiles for 1995. Quite a select group. They all have the kind of safety features you would expect, like dual airbags, anti-lock braking systems, and reinforced body structure. They all have outstanding performance credentials, as you would expect. And they all have the kind of sticker price you would expect of a vehicle in such an elite group. All except one, the 1995 Ford Contour. It's nice to be in such good company, but not all the time. Being a pilot, it's not just handling the stick controls, it's, it's what goes on up here. I'd say I tend to be a detail sort of person. And in this business, if you don't pay attention to detail, you're dead. In this past year, we've done training for people from uh, both the U.S. and Canada. Our Advantage 800 number gives us the opportunity to reach these people who are spread over North America. It gives us a, an instant credibility, and it puts us in with the major U.S. competitors, the big boys, if you want. There you see David Archer standing on the sidelines in the Alamo Dome. He was expected to start today's football contest, but in return they go with Jimmy Kemp because of that nasty little groin pull. It was a situation where we, the, the, the week where you play two in one week came the wrong week for us. I, I pulled it against Edmonton. We had to play Wednesday in Winnipeg. I couldn't play, and then we lost to Winnipeg in a game we thought we were going to win. And so I was forced into action against Saskatchewan the following Sunday and tore it in a different place. So it's got two tears in it, trying to mend it. Uh, sat last week, so here I am facing uh, the best team in the league, and, and uh, this, it's just going to be one of those game, game situations, how it feels when we get ready to go. It's been a frustrating year for David Archer, a nagging muscle pull that has kept him out of the lineup, and so he watches as Jimmy Kemp goes to work. And Kemp is back in the shotgun on first down. The penalty, by the way, was against San Antonio. Illegal block. They fake to Saunders, and now Kemp up and throwing. And has a man up at the 35-yard line as he completes it up there to Kittrick Taylor. And Taylor should have a San Antonio first down, which would be their first. And again, uh, Calgary in the zone defense. Kemp's doing a nice job. He's got a guy in the flat. That pulls the flat cover man out. And the deep guy just can't get there in Al Jordan, but that's what you got to do in the zone defense. Find the holes, run the curl patterns, run some flood into the different areas and try and get into those holes. A gain of 13 was good for a Texans first down up at the 36-yard line. And now Kemp gives it off to Saunders. He's got the big guys in front of him. Now Saunders running it around the corner and he can't. What a play by Ken Leonard to restrict the gain to three yards as he got in at submarine Mike Saunders. 
And you know, Mike Saunders is one of those guys who runs a great, does a great job on draws and screens and is good out of the backfield with the hands, but speed to the outside is something that is questionable. And a good job by Kent Leonard coming up and cutting the feet out of Saunders because he can't get to the corner. Good speed by Leonard and run support. After a gain of three and second and seven. And Kent quickly up over the middle and he has it to the fullback, Tony Burst. And Burst has another San Antonio first down, a gain of 10 yards up to the 50-yard line. Well, two things come to this play. One is that you got three or four yards out of Mike Saunders on first down. That opens up a little more in your offense. Now, Calgary gives them that same zone look. They throw to the back underneath in Burst, and he's going to make Marvin Pope miss. Get a couple extra yards on his own, and that's what you want when you see the zone defense. Dump it to those backs, but the key is they were in second and seven, not in second and ten. And now, excuse me, and now on first down from their own 50. Kim to the far sidelines. As it there to Billy Hess, and Hess has a whole bunch more as he gets down to the 43-yard line. Billy Hess does some good work after the catch. And Hess has a gain of 17 yards and another San Antonio first down. And again, he's got the ball in front of Al Jordan, who's in the deep zone. So he can't jump this. He can't be up in there because he's got deep coverage. Hess makes the catch, makes a couple of guys miss, and then gets the first down. But right now, San Antonio throwing underneath the coverage in the zone defense. And hopefully their guys are breaking tackles. And right now they're getting that. And once again on first down, Kemp goes to the shotgun. And the give it to Saunders, and he is stacked up big time. Sreko Zizakovic, Marvin Pope, and Anthony McClanahan were there first. As soon as they saw the fullback, Tony Burst, move that hole, they went right to it. Well, this is where the film work comes in, because you can see how quickly the Calgary defense reacts to that. Zizakovic, Pope's in there, and... McClanahan, they all read the mail on that play. That's that's what you call preparation and doing your homework. Something with San Antonio's offense was the key to Marvin Pope. Read the play and was right in the backfield. It was a loss of three. Kemp has three receivers to the near side. Calgary has six defensive backs in. Kemp to the far sideline is picked off. And look out, Marvin Pope and pushing off. touchdown. Marvin Coleman with his CFL leading fifth interception of the year has a 78 yard touchdown but wait there's a flag on the play at the 25 yard line. It's coming back. Oh what a break for San Antonio. That ball just hung up there. Coleman jumped in front to make the interception, but it'll all be for naught. Now we'll see if this was ha this penalty happened after the interception or before and see who gets the football, because if it was after, that just negates the run back. Illegal contact on an eligible receiver. Calgary number 30, second down repeated. So it's an illegal contact on a receiver by Kenton Leonard before the interception. A 10-yard penalty on Kenton Leonard brings up second and three now for the San Antonio Texans. Wow. What a turnaround. Huge penalty. Huge penalty. Coleman takes it all the way to the end zone. It comes all the way back. And now San Antonio has another crack with second and two to go. What a turnaround for Wally Buono and his Calgary Stampeders to have that penalty. But some illegal contact downfield by Ken Leonard. The rest found it and saw it. And wow. Play. In the final minute of the first quarter, Jimmy Kemp of the San Antonio Texans just caught a major break. They get to the fullback, Tony Burns, and he got smoked by Stu Laird. Stu Laird jumped in there to make the stop along with Matt Finley. And now it'll bring up third and at least two yards. And San Antonio, which leads the Canadian Football League in field goal tries, We'll try one here from the 42. You talked about sudden change. We talked about how Calgary, when they got that turnover, turned it into seven quick points. That's responding to sudden change. Now, that was a big turnaround for San Antonio, who didn't take advantage of a second and a couple of yards. 
The only two field goal kickers in the league who were over 90% this season are in the game today. Mark McLaughlin for Calgary and Roman Anderson for San Antonio. This from the 42. And Anderson, who has missed only twice all season, puts it through. The San Antonio Texans are on the board. Trailing 7-3, it could have been a lot worse. Welcome back to CFL Control. It is indeed a busy day in the world of sports. The third round of the PGA Championship continues to be played at the Riviera Golf and Country Club at the Pacific Palisades in California. Ernie Els and Mark O'Meara walk into today's round as the co-leaders at 11 under par. They are just about to begin teeing off. Jay Haas, just a couple strokes back. You see the shark, he is circling at eight under par. How about Corey Pavin and Big John Daly? They have both won majors this year. They both did not make the cut. Meanwhile, she is one of Canada's most prolific tennis players. Hurricane Helen Kelsey underwent 15 hours of brain surgery yesterday to remove a tumor. They are saying that the surgery was a success. We are going to take a short break. Stay tuned. We're back with more in just a moment. This month, when it comes to baseball, this is where the big games are. Jay's Expos, TSN, August. Back for the second quarter at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. I'm Gord Miller along with Glenn Suter. By the way, if your audio is sounding a little gravelly today, it's not your set. It's 90 degrees outside, so naturally I have a cold. <laughs> yeah, let's not mix up our glasses of water here. You got, you got it, pal. <laughs> well, Wally Buono had a conversation with the officials after that last call, and Kent Leonard nullified Marvin Coleman's fifth interception of the season. So instead of leading 14 to nothing, his team is up 7 to 3. And this San Antonio rushing attack, which is number one in the CFL, has run for just one yard in the first quarter. And Calgary is tough against the run. The Stampeders have allowed only one rushing touchdown all season. And you saw a couple of stats there that were key. Penalties for Calgary, that big one to Ken Leonard, of course, a 10-point swing. And turnovers for San Antonio, one that turned into seven points for the stand. Here's Pee Wee Smith for the 20-yard line. And Smith is upended at the 32-yard line on a great special teams play made by Bobby Humphrey. So Doug Flutie will come back to work, and Flutie, of course, the main attraction here in San Antonio. There was so much talk about him in the newspapers and on television here. Primarily, though, he's been billed as the 84 tri Heisman Trophy winner, not the four-time CFL MVP. Four-time CFL MVP and on pace to beat his best every year yardage-wise. How about that? Now Flutie to the shotgun as Tony Stewart and Dave Sapunjas in motion. Calgary with a six receiver and Flutie, quick drop. Over the middle he goes to Allen Pitts, but the pass falls incomplete on a good defensive play made by Grady Kavnis, number 24. Grady Kavnis, you say? Yes, it's the son of the former BC line and Winnipeg Blue Bomber. I remember watching Grady Kavnis play a little bit over in Empire Stadium in BC, but zone defense, Kavnis got the deep zone, but does a good job of closing on Pitts after the ball's in the air. Now, when you're in a zone defense, you can't leave until the ball is thrown or you vacate your zone. Kavnis did a nice closing job once the ball was thrown. We're in the second quarter. Pitts and Sapunjas have yet to make a catch. Here comes the rush on Flutie, who got it away for Sapunjas, and Sapunjas almost made a circus catch. In fact, he had to take it away from linebacker Tom Gerhardt, but Doug Flutie took a hit after making the throw. You've got to be impressed so far with the coverage ability of the San Antonio Texans. Right now, you'll see Doug Flutie in the pocket and getting a little bit of pressure, so he has to get rid of it immediately. Looked like James Kane coming from the top of your screen got in on Flutie. He has to get rid of the ball. Throws it deep down the field where uh, Tom Gearhart had great coverage on Allen, or on, uh, excuse me, Dave Sapunjas, and couldn't come up with the completion, but pressure the key there. Now Tony Martino with the puck. 
And David Lucas from the 30. Not much doing there on a solid special teams play made once again by Raymond Biggs. A two-yard return after a 47-yard punt. CFL Live, brought to you in part by 3M Canada. Imagining the unthinkable and developing the unknown. That's 3M Innovation at Work. Welcome back to the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, which the Texans share with the San Antonio Spurs of the NBA. And a good crowd on hand this afternoon on a rainy day in Sacramento to see if Jimmy Kemp and the San Antonio Texans could upset Doug Flutie and the Calgary Stampeders. On first down, Kemp. Lots of time, looking deep, and now Kemp to run. And not much doing there as Shreko Zizakovic and Matt Finley came in to make the stop, but Jimmy Kemp was looking deep all the way. Yeah, Kemp was looking down the field. Well, I'll tell you what was key there for Kemp was the block of Mike Saunders on Marvin Pope. Kemp's going to roll out. Saunders' job is to pick up Pope coming right there, and you'll see 91 get driven by by Mike Saunders. So not only can he run that ball and catch it out of the backfield, but not a bad job blocking on one of the best pass-rushing linebackers in the league. And Archer looks on. We'll see if we get a chance to see him later on today, but since he didn't start, it would seem doubtful. Second and seven. Kemp out to the flat. And the fullback, Tony Burst, just dropped the football. Yeah, he has 18 catches for 140 yards. He's known as good hands coming out of the backfield. I believe that's the second one he's dropped for San Antonio. Not that he would have had many yards because Matt Finley was right in his hip pocket with him out there in the flat, but one you want to catch anyway. Todd Jordan will punt again. And Pee Wee Smith and Terry Vaughn are once again back deep to receive. Jordan continues to wait. Vaughn now kicks it away. It's a low driving kick to Vaughn at the 32. Vaughn got by a couple but couldn't beat the third man as Burst got down to make the stop. A 43-yard punt, a return of six. Gallagher leads 7-3. We'll be back in a moment. and 15 years of tradition. One distinctive recipe. Zero preservatives. Too smooth for words. 100% Canadian brewed. 5% alcohol. Equals one good beer. It's all we do, because this bud's for you. Round 10 of the 1995 Formula One World Championship makes its way to Budapest for the Hungarian Grand Prix. An informative pre-race show ignites the action, followed by the Green Light Live, Sunday morning on Real TV TSN. opened in Vancouver in 1983 and played host to a Grey Cup game in its first year. Sky Dome in Toronto opened in 1989. It too played host to a Grey Cup game in its first year. And in 1993, the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas opened as the home to an NBA team. And you have to wonder, Glenn, how long it'll be before this stadium gets perhaps a Grey Cup bid. Well, we were talking about that as we were coming in, taking a look. It's a beautiful facility. costs $186 million to build, and it would be perfect to host a great cup. What was the first dome stadium in the CFL? The first dome stadium. BC Place. No, the Big O. The Big O. That had a hole in the middle. No, no, they, they, <laughs> they finally got the roof on, though. <laughs> First and 10 Gallagher from the 37 yard line. Flutie, play action pass, and he has a pick down by Bobby Humphrey. Here comes Bobby Humphrey waiting for a block on Pitts. And Humphrey gets all the way down the 26 yard line. Only the fifth time this year that Doug Flutie has been intercepted. And that in 
itself is an amazing stat. Only five interceptions for Doug Flutie, but this one he throws a slightly behind Terry Vaughn. He can't get to the football. It looks like a little miscommunication between receiver and quarterback. Bobby Humphreys, the veteran, has been here for three years now with the same team, and he takes the interception, a big turnover for San Antonio, and you know that Doug Flutie is not happy with that play because he wanted Terry Vaughn on that post pattern, but either Terry Vaughn didn't realize he had to go there or they're, they're going to straighten it out on the sidelines right now. Calgary scored a touchdown off the San Antonio turnover. Now the handoff goes, the fake goes right on. Jimmy King comes up across the 20. Still going, kept down the three. Kenny Walker finally made the stop after a game of 23, but what a fake by Jimmy Kim. That was a great move. He started looking a little bit like Mike Saunders coming out of the backfield, his running ability. Watch Kim on the play action fake right here. That draws Pope into the middle. Now he gets outside, breaks containment, and here comes the move right there on Greg. Knocks the free safety. Gets him down to the three-yard line. Looks a little bit like Mike Saunders on that running play. Now first and goal from the three, and the short yardage offense is in for San Antonio. But Kemp wants to talk it over. He and Kay Stevenson are having trouble getting their signals straight. Again, that was a great call. San Antonio, known for their running. They're about 50-50 run and pass so far this season. Calgary thinks they're going to run the ball. They go with the play action. Naked bootleg to Kemp, who's not known for his running ability. Good surprise call by San Antonio. Well, Kemp had only run the ball 10 times coming into this game for 15 yards, so he more than doubles his rushing average on one carry. What a move. Now he's got a chance to give his team the lead. First and goal from the three. Saunders is deep in the eye. The toss to Saunders. Saunders, touchdown. There's a flag. Flag down at the two-yard line right at the line of scrimmage. Offside Calgary, the touchdown will stand. Offside, Calgary number 95. The line, only the second rushing touchdown the Calgary defense has yielded this year, and it gives San Antonio the lead. You see the pitch out right there to Saunders. Now he has the option to cut back. Matt Finley takes away that option, cutting up through that hole. So Saunders takes it to the outside and wins the foot race to the goal line. Sudden change again on the turnover. Calgary got seven out of it. And now San Antonio picks up seven. Mike Saunders with his fifth rushing touchdown of the year. And Roman Anderson to the point after all kinds of early movement. And I believe Calgary was quick to jump. Outside Calgary is the call. They'll assess that on the kickoff. So the San Antonio Texans take advantage of the turnover. The interception by Bobby Humphrey. And get it down to the three-yard line thanks to the run by Jimmy Kemp, who took off for 23 yards. That's something I'm sure that Calgary did not see on the game film was Jimmy Camp running the football. No, they sure didn't, especially Outside. with those kind of moves. Calgary number 91. There'll be five yards on the kickoff. Mark Pierce is called for offside, so the penalty will be assessed on the kickoff. And San Antonio has not taken many penalties in this football game, which is true to form. The Texans come in as the least penalized team in the Canadian Football League. So Anderson for the point after. To give his team a three-point lead. Anderson puts it up and through, and the San Antonio Texans with a 10-7 lead over the Calgary San Peters with 10-41 to play in the second quarter. Imagine adhesive so strong they help hold together 100 tons of soaring transportation. Imagine a fabric so bright it lets you see an accident in time to prevent it. Imagine a single disc so powerful it can store almost everything imaginable and protect it for a lifetime. These products and thousands more that make our lives better exist because the people at 3M imagine.
There are no prizes for making someone smile. No tributes for unlocking life's little mysteries. But to the men who give their best every day, we give our best. Gillette Sensor XL. Spring-mounted twin blades that adjust to your face and soft, flexible microfins that set up your beard and Gillette Series aftershave conditioner to moisturize your skin. Sensor XL for the closest, most comfortable shave ever. Gillette, the best a man can get. Elvis Joyco goes for the big one and gets the jump on taste. The taste of McCain Frozen Punch. Year-round thirst-quenching tastes like grape. Orange and McCain Fruit Punch. Made with real fruit juices for real fruit taste. That makes McCain the punch of champions like Elvis Stoico. Get the jump on taste. The real fruit taste of McCain Frozen Punch. Go for McCain. Get the jump on taste. The scoring drive brought to you by Natural Ice Lip Balm. Two plays, 26 yards. It was all set up by Bobby Humphrey's interception of Doug Flutie and Jimmy Kemp's 24-yard run, capped off by Mike Saunders, who scored his fifth rushing touchdown of the season. And now the Calgary Stampeders trail by a score of 10 to 7 after thinking earlier they led 14 to nothing. And Roman Anderson will kick it off. And the Calgary Stampeders have received the fewest number of kickoffs in the CFL this year. But the number getting threatened here today. This is only the 15th kickoff they've received this season. Here's Vaughn from the 10. Terry Vaughn has a seam and gets all the way out to the 33-yard line. As the stop is made by Billy Hess, a 65-yard kickoff, a return of 23. Well, the Stampeders have enjoyed very poor field position throughout the first half. In fact, their only touchdown scored after the fumble recovery by Stu Laird gave them the ball to the San Antonio 38. How many times have you seen punt, punt, punt interception from the Calgary San Peter offense? Terry Vaughn, the, punt, the kickoff returner, is injured on the play, and now Wally Buono wants to talk to his Calgary San Peter defense. You know what he's talking about on the sideline was the play action fake that Jim Kemp took it around the corner to set up the Mike Saunders touchdown because Marvin Pope took off in there on the running game and Wally Bono's likely just saying to his linebackers, listen, the run is not going to hurt us. Let's play smart and, and stay in our responsibilities. If you have containment, stay in containment. Here's the touchdown. You see Saunders just take off for the, for the corner of the end zone. It was a good job by the Calgary defense to string it out, but Saunders with some speed to the outside outruns everybody to the corner. First and ten, Flutie swings it out for Tony Stewart, and Stewart has some room to run. Stewart out across the 40 to the 44-yard line. A gain of 11 yards for a first down. The tackle made by Malcolm Frank. Tony Stewart playing this week with an injured elbow suffered last week, but his biggest problem this year is one that haunted him earlier. Four fumbles coming into this football game. And you know, when you have a banged up elbow, holding the ball becomes that much tougher. You're trying to protect that elbow a little bit. You sometimes have the ball in that hand. It becomes a little more, a little tougher to hang on to that football. Well, they're calling for a measurement here, but the sticks have already moved. <laughs> this should be interesting. There is no infraction on the play. First down. Yeah, first down. The Sticks guys thought it was a first down. They've got a better view than anybody. Stamps out to their own 44-yard line. Ten minutes to play now in the second quarter. And Calgary trailing. Flutie again from the shotgun. Looking over the middle for David Sapungis. And that pass broken up by Charles Franks. And David Sapunja is still without a catch in this football game. Yeah, Sapunja is working on Tom Gira. You've seen them in a couple of times in man-to-man. -man. That time it was a zone, and Sapunja tries to slide into the hole, but Flutie sees the hole slightly before Sapunja, and he gets past the, the window of opportunity. Second down, Flutie waits out to the flat to Stewart. Stewart's got to get the midfield for the first down. He does, and then some. Into 
this San Antonio territory down to the 52-yard line. The linebacker Leonard Nelson made the stop, but it's a pickup of 14 yards for Tony Stewart and a Calgary first down. Two yards from his offense and 10, 12 yards from Stewart himself. He gets the ball out in the flat. Flutie being a little more patient in this series, taking what the defense is giving him. Dumps it in the flat in front of the zone, and Wallace misses there. Stewart keeps running. Humphreys misses. Gearhart misses. Good job keeping your feet moving for a running back. First down. Flutie out to the flat to Tony Stewart, and Stewart is down to the 45-yard line for a gain of seven. Seeing a lot different in uh, philosophy for the Calgary Stampeders. We saw him try and go down the field to, to Pitts and Sapunjas early in the game, and now Flutie's just content with dumping it off to his backs. This is the first time the Calgary offense has been able to put the ball in the San Antonio side of the field on its own. and a flag is down. The pass is complete over the middle of Allen Pitts. But this will come back. It's Pitts' first catch of the game. But it'll be wiped out by a penalty. Vince Danielson was offside by at least a couple of steps for Calgary. This is very uncharacteristic of the Calgary Stampeder. Yeah, it happens when you get pressed, though, when you're in closer games. Offside. Calgary number 21. Repeat second down. They call offside on Tony Stewart, but I think it was Vince Danielson who had moved ahead of the snap count. Now the stamps are backed up to the 50, and you notice that Doug Flutie was forced to go under center instead of the shotgun because of the crowd noise here in San Antonio. sidelines. Leonard Nelson came up the middle untouched as did Dave Harper and Doug Flutie just threw that to the sideline to save his skin. San Antonio coming with the big pressure. Leonard Nelson from his middle linebacker positions coming up in there. David Harper number 58 comes up untouched on the all-out blitz by San Antonio. Flutie has no choice but just to throw it to the open area and very fortunate that he didn't get an intentional grounding call because absolutely nobody over there for Calgary. And now Martino to punt for the fifth time. David Lucas is the lone man back for the San Antonio Texans who lead this game 10 to 7. And a good kick by Martino. David Lucas from the five. He's got a seat with the side. Lucas has got the punt of the beat. He's by Martino. And it's a foot race to the end zone. David Lucas. 105 yard touchdown. And there are no flags. takes the punt 105 yards for the score. Roman Anderson with a point after. And San Antonio with a 17-7 lead over the Calgary Stampeders. And they're on their feet at the Alamo Dome. Imagine adhesive so strong they help hold together 100 tons of soaring transportation. Imagine a fabric so bright it lets you see an accident in time to prevent it. Imagine a single disc so powerful it can store almost everything imaginable and protect it for a lifetime. 
These products and thousands more that make our lives better exist because the people at 3M imagine. The Canadian Football League 1995 Facts, Figures, and Records book. It's your source for the landmark play, the vital stats, the award-winning players, the complete rules, and the outstanding performances all the way to the Grey Cup. To order your copy, call 1-800-667-1251. The celebration continues in San Antonio, where David Lucas has a 105-yard punt return for a touchdown. David Lucas, the number one receiver for Shreveport last year, comes over to San Antonio, and it was a good job of blocking because Lucas really only had to put his first move on when he got to Tony Martino, the punter, and then he just outruns everyone to the end zone, and the celebration begins for Lucas. And the Calgary Stampeders face the biggest deficit they've faced all season long. This is a team that's only trailed at the half once this season. Very interesting to see how they respond to coming from behind because you don't often see it from Calgary. Roman Anderson kicks it off and Terry Vaughn will try to answer for the Stampeders from the 12. Vaughn stopped up initially and fights his way out to the 27-yard line. But getting down quickly on the special teams is Mike Dingle to stop Terry Vaughn's progress. So now Flutie and this Calgary offense have to settle down and get back in this football game. And Flutie's just the man to do it. Well, you saw in the last series when Doug Flutie came out there, he was dumping off to his backs to Tony Stewart and taking what the defense was giving him. He's going to be patient. He knows in the Canadian Football League there's tons of time, and you can be down by a lot more than this and still come back. So he'll stick with his game plan. On first and ten from the 28-yard line, Flutie with the gift to Tony Stewart. Stewart gets off tackle all across the 30 to the 31-yard line. Stop is made by Willie Fears and by Tom Gerhardt. So down below, Wally Buono and John Huffnagel look on, and up top, Larry Rickman, the owner of the Calgary Stampeders, is watching the extra superstitious Larry Rickman. I was trying to convince him before the game that what socks you wear have nothing to do with how your team plays. And then you're supposed to wash them. Let's wash them anyway. <laughs> hey, when you're 6-0, you don't take chances. On second now from the 31, the pass incomplete for Dave Sapunzic. He had it for a moment and dropped it. Tom Gerhardt there on the coverage. And once again, the Calgary hunting unit will come on the field. Alan Pitts and David Sapunzic are still wearing the collar. Neither man has a catch yet today. That's amazing. And you see in this play how Dave Sapunjas just straight out drops the pass from Doug Flutie. You don't see that very often, but you know when you get into pressure games, it's one thing to have everything going your way and to be up by 20, 30 points. It's a lot easier to make that catch or to play defense then, but when you're down by 10 in a close game, the pressure starts to mount a little bit. And Lucas is back there again for San Antonio. And this time, they kick it away from him. Marcus Gates fights his way out close to the 50-yard line. Stopped at the 49, a 35-yard punt, a return of five. And San Antonio has the ball back. Doug Flutie has just 62 yards passing in the first half. The two leading receivers in the Canadian Football League are Ofer. And David Lucas, with a 105-yard punt return, breaks the team record for the longest punt return, formerly held by Rod Harris, who took one back 102 yards against Vegas last year. And let's not forget, for those for that game story as well, a couple of key penalties have really turned this game around for the Stamps. First and 10 Texans from their own 49. Calgary showing blitz. Here it comes. Three, and the give is to Sanders. Saunders trying to get around the corner, but he's corralled that time by Alondra Johnson. A gain of maybe a yard. And you don't think that Alondra Johnson has some great speed? We got a great shot of him. Watch the speed of the big man coming out and running down the tailback in Mike Saunders all the way out to the numbers from the far side of the hash mark on the other side of the field. He covered a lot of ground there. Leading tackler in 1994 for the Calgary Stampeders with 77. Boy, that's some great speed for a linebacker. 
And there's an injured San Antonio Texan. It's number 80, Billy Hess. And as he receives some attention, let's go back for some attention from Darren at our CFL control center. Thanks very much, gentlemen. You know what? Our next game will come to you Monday afternoon. It should be a pretty good one. You've got the BC Lions, the Toronto Argonauts. There you see Darren Floaty dancing into the end zone for one of his two touchdowns this season. 7.35 start out here on the East Coast on the Eastern time. Let's get back to the Alamo Dome. Thanks very much, Darren. Second and nine for the Texans from their own 50. Here comes the blitz, and Camp has the pass batted down. Stu Laird, who already has a fumble recovery, very nearly had an interception as Shreko Zizakovic, six foot five, got the hands up to make him about seven two. I was amazed. Well, then some. I was amazed at the speed of Stu Laird to try and get to that football as it's popped up in the air because. You know, it takes a lot of energy to pass rush. You're working one-on-one -on -one with a guy. You're pounding your head against each other. A lot of energy. And then he flew out there. And Big Drekko got his hand up in Kemp's face. Todd Jordan back to punt. Here comes the rush. And Jordan gets a good punt away. Terry Vaughn back up to the 12-yard line. Vaughn reverses his field and gets not much. And down quickly was Marcus Gates, a 48-yard punt a return of eight so once again the Calgary offense will be backed up beginning this drive at their own 20 yard line so far the game plan for San Antonio defensively working perfectly keeping Doug Flutie in the pocket restricting his passing lanes and then just playing some mixture of zone and man-to-man -man defense behind it but so far Flutie hasn't had the good sight lines down the field to be able to throw to Sapunjus and Pitts those favorite two receivers and he's had to dump it to the backs Amazing stat on Doug Flutie. He has gone over 20,000 yards passing as a stampeder today in just over three seasons. Wow. First down, Flutie from the shotgun. Gets it out for Pitts. Pitts close to the first down as he stretches for the 30-yard line. And the coverage was provided there by Jason Wallace. It's a gain of 10, and Pitts' his first catch of the football game. Finally well, gets the ball to his favorite receiver and Allen Pitts, and he restricts the field. Puts Pitts on the short side of the field. So he gets a better look at rolling that way and taking a look right at him. More of a one-on-one -on -one matchup, and he likes that, of course. Got to get this guy involved in the offense if you want success. Pitts does not have a touchdown catch in his last two games. That's a drought for him. Here comes the blitz. Flutie in trouble. Gets it away for Pitts, and what a catch up at the 39-yard line. Just shy of a first down, a gain of nine as Pitts just picked it up off the turf. A nice catch and a great job by Doug Flutie to get the ball off because Roosevelt Collins came completely untouched. Bruce Beaton completely missed him coming off that corner. But Doug Flutie got off it and threw it out there and got it to Pitts, who made the nice catch for him. Second and less than a yard. This is a situation where Flutie has been known to go deep. Instead, he gives it out to Tony Stewart. Stewart diving for the 40-yard line. Should have the first down. Be very close here because uh, nice job by San Antonio on that front four to stop him up. But Stewart didn't quite, I don't think he quite made it. We'll see what the measurement brings. Tell you that for Calgary, though, if he didn't make it, he's inches away, so they'll likely go for it anyway. He needed to get the 40 yard line, and oh. he came up just that short. Third down, and maybe four or five inches for the Calgary Stampeders. And not much of a gamble, really, for Wally Buono. This should be Doug Clutie straight ahead. Flutie dives ahead. He has the first down easily with time winding down here in the second quarter. And Calgary down by 10. Yeah, when you have a yard off the ball there, it's pretty automatic. The only thing that can go wrong in a short yardage situation like that is if you fumble the snap. Flutie didn't. First down for Calgary. Wally Buono's team is on the move. But Doug Flutie and the Calgary Stampeders trail the San Antonio Texans 17-7.
Dear Dave, after session last week, we had your new smoky bacon cheeseburgers. One bite, and we said, man, whoever made this has paid his dues. Three strips of hickory smoked bacon, processed smoked cheddar with that sauce, all on a quarter pound of fresh ground beef with sautéed onions. Dave, it was so delicious, Lucille and I played a whole set of low-down blues. <laughs> your pal, B.B. King. Here, B.B., keep smiling. You'll beat those blues yet. Try Wendy's new smoky bacon cheeseburger. One healthy-looking, shiny Pantene hair? Begin at the root. This is Panthenol, also called Provitamin B5. It's in Pantene Pro-V Provitamin Shampoo and Conditioner. Always was, always will be. Pantene's Provitamins penetrate deeply into your hair, deep into the root, where healthier-looking hair begins, while conditioners improve your hair all the way to the tips. For hair so healthy-looking it shines, get Pantene Pro-V. Get back to your roots. Welcome back to CFL Control. Coming up at McDonald's Halftime, we will preview the two other games that will be played in the Canadian Football League tonight, which includes Winnipeg and Birmingham. We will have a feature on Doug Flutie and Gordon Glenn will give us their first half thoughts. And it's a surprising first half so far in this contest. Let's get back out to the Alamo, though. Welcome back to San Antonio, where Roman Anderson and the Texans lead Calgary 17-7. This will be the sixth play of this drive for the Calgary Stampeders, their longest drive of the football game. That tells you something right there. First and ten from their own 41, and Flutie to the shotgun. Looking up over the top, he's got Pee Wee Smith, but the pass was in behind him. Jason Wallace back on the coverage. That's the first pass that's gone in Pee Wee's direction today. And you can see that Doug Flutie is getting hot. You know what the guy that puts up the numbers that Doug Flutie does and has throughout this, his career in the CFL, he's going to get frustrated in a hurry. And the Stamps are in their hurry-up offense. Second down, Flutie gets outside, looks over the middle for Vaughn, but has it broken up. Great defensive play by Malcolm Frank. Third down coming up, and Calgary will be forced to punt again. Kay Stevenson thinks Malcolm Frank is his best cover man. In that situation, they were in man-to-man -man defense, and Malcolm Frank makes the great play. Flutie rolls out, breaks containment, which he hasn't been able to do all game, but then Malcolm Frank coming across on Terry Vaughn and knocking that ball down. That's just straight man-to-man -man coverage and staying right in the hip and when the ball's in the air, making the play. Malcolm Frank, yet another San Antonio Texan who played his college football in Texas. There are more than a dozen on the roster today. What a kick by Martino. As he stepped away from the rush, he put it right over David Lucas's head, and it goes out of bounds in the end zone for a single, a 72-yard single by Tony Martino, who kind of punched at that ball because he was trying to step around the rush. Yeah, what a kick. Tried to avoid the rush, and it looked like his momentum helped him in the kick, 72 yards. But you know what? He's disappointed on the sideline right now because he would have liked to have seen that bounce out in the one-inch line, one-yard line area. It did go in for the single, but Martino would rather have had that one go out on the one. And he was talking to another former punter on the sidelines, his coach, Wally Buono. Maybe the only linebacker slash punter in the CFL. Were there many of those? Not many. You know, you ask Wally Bono what he does with the coaching of his kicking game, and Bono says, I don't really do anything. I just go watch him. If they have problems they want, they'll come and ask me for some advice. And for punters, it's usually just the drop of the football. Now San Antonio with the ball at its own 35-yard line. Two and a half minutes to play here in the first half. Kemp has time and has a man. There's a flag down. As he completed it up there to Mark Stock, the coverage is provided by Gerald Vaughn up at the 45-yard line. It's a gain of exactly 10 yards. And pass interference is the call against Calgary. Yeah, I don't know about this one, Gord. I, Gerald Vaughn came over and made the play and stuck his hand in there. It was awfully close in the Four official that called it. Calgary number 38, first down. They call it on Vaughn. Well, let's take a look, and you be the judge. Vaughn is going to be in behind, breaking up on the play and reaches around. And did he get there too soon? I don't know. It was pretty close. But the official that made the call was behind, so I don't know. 
<laughs> Spoken like a true defensive back. Absolutely. First and ten from the 47, and they get it out to the near side to Billy Hess. And Hess has another first down as he gets into Calgary territory to the Stampeder 52-yard line. And Anthony McClanahan comes out to make the stop. What a start that Anthony McClanahan had in his first game last week. Eight tackles, fumble recovery, a sack, and he's flying around the football and getting involved. He's coming from the linebacker position, hitting the receiver out of bounds on the sideline. Great range for these Calgary linebackers. They've had to do some juggling. McClanahan goes into the linebacker position. Will Johnson out with the hamstring. Marvin Pope is playing that rush position. Now Kemp from the shotgun, fakes to Saunders. That gives him lots of time. And Kemp has a man wide open down at the 35-yard line. As he gets it down there to Mark Stock, a gain of 17 yards. But the fake to Saunders bought him the time. Well, Kemp did a nice job of reading the defense and taking time. He's given time by that big offensive lineman. Play action. He'll stand in the pocket, wait for it to develop. And in the zone defense that Calgary was... Presenting to Kemp, he waits for his receiver to find the hole and finds him. And lots of time here for the Texans to do some more damage on first and 10 from the 35-yard line. Kemp sets up the screen pass to Saunders. He's got blocks in front of him. Saunders inside the 20 and down close to the 15-yard line. Great call by San Antonio. Calgary's been giving them a steady, a steady diet of zone defense because they want to make the young Kemp read the defense. He's doing a good job of it right now because you'll see Matt Finley goes. Now, one linebacker is not a blitz sometimes. It's just a stunt. The zone is set up. Jump the ball off to Mike Saunders underneath the zone and then let him do what he does best, and that makes people miss. And Joe Kralik with the block that Calgary thought was a hole. Yeah, and Coleman playing with a bit of a broken wrist is trying to get off and around that block, but no hold there and good no call by the official. A gain of 19 yards, first and 10 from the 16-yard line. Here comes Saunders again, still through a block that time. Saunders gets around the corner and gets inside the 10 to the 9-yard line. After four straight completions, Jimmy Kemp got down and made a block. At all for the San Antonio, Texas, but this man is the key for them. Mike Saunders is going to get the ball. He's got big pulling guards coming around with him. Just finds a hole. Pope can't get out there. And Saunders, number one in yards from the line of scrimmage in the CFL. Now second and three from the nine-yard line. Kemp in the shotgun. The kid goes back to Saunders, up through the middle, and Saunders has a first down as he gets down to the Calgary five-yard line. That's that same play we saw earlier where the fullback Tony Burst goes to the point of attack, and they run Saunders right at it. It was stuffed earlier this time. It met San Antonio a first down. It really is the only running play that you can do out of the shotgun. It's basically just a draw give the ball to Mike Saunders, but Kemp was in the shotgun that time and hands it off, and Saunders is great. That's one of his best running plays, just getting that draw and picking his holes. Timeout. And now San Antonio, Calgary. or rather Calgary, calls timeout. You see Frank Spaziani on the right-hand side. He's the defensive coordinator. Wally Buono is down there as well with defensive line coach Bob Vespaziani in the background. Well, as we mentioned, Calgary has never lost to this franchise, which used to be the Sacramento Gold Miners. In fact, Calgary has never lost to a U.S.-based team in its history. You know, both those games, though, were close games. I mean, that 39-25 score doesn't indicate that by the score, but I remember that game, and it was uh, it was a tight one for Calgary. So this team seems to give the stamps out of anyone in the league the most trouble. Well, we should also mention the Edmonton Eskimos, the game after Labor Day. That doesn't have <laughs> <been> trouble. <laughs> First and goal from the six, and Kemp is in the shotgun. Low snap. Kemp under pressure to the end zone. Mark stop. Jimmy Kemp almost forgot he had to hold to the point after. He's so excited. What a play by Kemp. After the whistle stuff going on down there right now, hey, these Calgary Stampeders aren't used to being behind. They're not like, they don't like it. Treko Sizakovic and Kenny Walker were in the middle of it with the center, Mike Kisselin. 
Now, there are no flags down right now, but tempers definitely boiling over. San Antonio leads 23-8 with a point after to come. Now, the reason this happened is one word. Composure by a quarterback. Has to go down to his bootstraps to pick up the, the snap off the shotgun and still has the composure to fire a dart out there. Kent Leonard can't get there and make the play. And big touchdown for San Antonio. Stock making a nice catch coming back to the football and blocking Leonard away from it. But composure by the young Jim Kemp. And the point after by Roman Anderson is good. 24 to 8. San Antonio leads Calgary with 1-12 to play in the first half. Well, you talked about Jim Kemp making the great play to pick up the snap. But perhaps an even better play to stand in there and take the lick. Well, he's got great composure after Ooh. having to go down. He still doesn't know what defense he's got because he hasn't been able to look. And then he takes the big hit by McClanahan. Hangs in there hit, but I just put six on the board, buddy. McClanahan doesn't like it. And this crowd is up and saluting the San Antonio Texans team, which has thus far dominated the Calgary Stampede. Seven plays, 75 yards, and Mark Stock with his second touchdown catch of the season gives San Antonio a 16-point lead. You know, we talked about the shotgun and what it can do for you, but one of the down parts of the shotgun is that you have to take your eyes off the defense when you're looking to catch the ball. Then if you get a bad snap, it's even tougher on the quarterback. He goes down, picks it up, and finds his receiver. What a job by Kevin. Terry Vaughn takes the kickoff back at his own eight-yard line. Calgary needs a spark. And now flags are down as Vaughn is dropped at the Stampede 26. CFL Live, brought to you in part by 3M Canada. Imagining the unthinkable and developing the unknown. That's 3M Innovation at Work. On the kickoff return by Terry Vaughn, face masking is the call against San Antonio. So Doug Flutie and the Calgary offense will start first and 10 at their own 44-yard line. from the shotgun, and the crowd will try to give him trouble. Here comes the rush. Flutie dumps it off for Tony Stewart. Stewart is off the run. Across midfield and down to the San Antonio 52-yard line with 57 seconds to play in the first half. And Calgary will quickly go to its hurry-up offense. Well, it's a good job by Flutie. Even though he's behind 24-8, he's still... Wants to stick with his game plan, and that time he had no one open downfield, had to dump it off to Stewart. The game was 13. Flutie, lots of time, gets it off for Pitts, and Pitts is up to the 47-yard line. He'll be five yards short of a Calgary first down. This is a real key drive for the Calgary Stampeders. They need to get some momentum back. It's been all San Antonio so far in this football game, and Calgary got to keep their frustrations down, keep with their game plan, and get some points on the board. And you can bet that John Huffnagel, the offensive coordinator, will have the X's and O's going at halftime. Including rolls to the near side, gets it there to base Danielson, who makes the catch in traffic, a first down at the 34-yard line. Now you're starting to see the Doug Flutie we're used to. He's in a rhythm, he's throwing the ball on time, he's being getting some time from that offensive line, and receivers are starting to click now. The game was 13 for Danielson. And Flutie remains in the shotgun. Receivers to the wide side of the field. Six defensive backs for San Antonio. It's the quarterback draw. And Flutie gets down to the 30-yard line. Pardon me, the 25. A gain of nine. It'll be a yard short of a first down. That's the second time that Flutie's come up shaking that wrist. He may have some kind of injury to his right arm. Yeah, it looks like he's kind of holding his hand or his thumb as well. And if it's his, if it's his thumb holding that football, it's a problem for a quarterback. If it's your passing hand, your thumb sore. 
back running, second and one. Clooney will jump straight ahead. Remember, the Stampeders used their timeout earlier on the San Antonio scoring drive, and Flutie does appear to be in some pain. And this is the worst possible news the Calgary Stampeders could have, never mind trailing at the half. The last thing they want to see is Doug Flutie with any kind of injury to his throwing hand. Clock is moving. Flutie from the shotgun. Lots of time. Floats went up to the sideline. Terry Vaughn, a great catch out there. Backs out of bounds at the 13-yard line. Not the throw he wanted to make, but Char Charles Franks comes over and helps out on Pitts on the corner route. He wanted to hit Pitts deep. He had to wait. Pitts was not there, so he goes out to the flat. And Vaughn just keeps his feet in bounds to make the catch and then goes out to stop the clock. Nine seconds left in the first half. Flutie's got time for two shots at the end zone. Here comes the blitz. Flutie to the end zone. Sponges. Touchdown. Just like that. And Dave Sponges with his first catch of the football game has a touchdown to get Calgary back in it. But Flutie is holding that right thumb and elbow. And we will check on his condition. He is supposed to hold for the point after try. We'll see if he does. Good throw by Flutie, especially with the bad thumb on his passing hand. But Sapunja is going to work on Gearhart again. He's going to go outside him and get the good two and a half steps on him. Nice throw, though, because that one was right over the top of Gearhart, where only Sapunja could catch it. And Flutie remains in to hold on the point after attempt by Mark McLaughlin. Flutie gets it down, and McLaughlin has made 301 straight. A big touchdown for the Calgary Stampeders. 24-15 is the score of San Antonio with three seconds to go in the first half. Now, when you're playing as a defensive back, the most important thing that you have to do when you have man-to-man -man coverage is take away the inside of a receiver. You're going to see the matchup here. Gearhart on Sapunjas. He has to take away the inside. That's why he turns his body. But Sapunjas just uses that speed to blow by him because Gearhart had turned too much and not stayed in his back pedal and kept his feet moving. You see what happens to Flutie if he gets that hand hit again. It doesn't look like you get it hit again there, but it's definitely bothering him in his thumb and elbow on that passing hand is definitely a problem. Sure didn't look like it on the throw there, though. No, perfect strike by Doug Flutie. It does appear to be the right elbow that's causing him the problem. We've seen him grab that a couple of times. Now Flutie on the sidelines. We'll see if he talks to athletic therapist Pat Clayton. So three seconds to play here in the opening half. The Calgary Stampeders get a touchdown to bring them within nine. And Doug Flutie engineers the drive in the final moments of this opening half. Takes them seven plays in just a minute nine for David Sapunjas to come up and make the reception for the touchdown his fifth of the year. Yeah, but a real key drive for the Calgary Stampeders after being down 24 to 8. They needed to get some momentum, and now they'll be able to kick this ball off and take that momentum into the locker room and hopefully for Calgary keep it coming out in the second half. Mark McLaughlin just tries to dribble it. He drove it right at San Antonio's Green Cabinet, and there's one second left on the clock. Well, it would be a 52 yard field goal try by Roman Anderson. I'll tell you why, why that happened. Mark McLaughlin does this on purpose because he wants to just let the ball roll around and kill the clock so that when they tackle him, it's over. But he doesn't expect Kavanaugh to knock it down right in front of him. Now, it backfires slightly because San Antonio has a shot at three more points. Well, Roman Anderson comes on for the field goal. He's three of four this year from outside the 50. Longest is 55, like I said, so can definitely within his range. Spots it down at the 53-yard line. On oh, this, the final play of the first half of the fake by Kemp. Kemp's in trouble, looking for an open receiver, and he is down. So after the surprising kickoff by Calgary, San Antonio comes up with an even more surprising play, the fake field goal, but it's stuffed up by Al Jordan. Still, San Antonio goes to the dressing room to a standing ovation. Late in Calgary, 24 to 15. Jimmy Kemp. The last-minute replacement for David Archer has done an outstanding job in the first half, and for only the second time this year, the Stamps trail after 30 minutes. McDonald's.
Halftime, presented by your local McDonald's restaurant. Here's Darren Detition. Welcome to McDonald's Halftime. What a wild finish to the first half. You know, tonight there are two other games on the CFL slate. The two and four Winnipeg Blue Bombers are in Birmingham to play the three and three Barracudas. Winnipeg will try and erase last week's nightmarish loss to the Pirates while Matt Dunnigan meets his former team. But while Dunny's teeing it up for the Cudas, former Birmingham backup Reggie Slack starts for Cal Murphy. Reggie's a veteran quarterback, and uh, he has a big play capability. I, I think our thing and our goal as a defense will be to, to limit them from the big plays, which has uh, hurt us the last few weeks as big plays against our defense. I think if we can stop the big plays and make them have to drive the ball down the field, you know, he gives the defense a great opportunity to make things happen. We know what, what, he, what each team does, so, I mean, it's a matter of uh, stopping the opponent, you know, when they run the, 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 the plays that, that you expect them to run. You know, Reggie knows all the defenses. <laughs> you know, but we're going to go out there and, you know, we're going to play the, the um, same thing. You know, we're not going to change that. we got the same scheme. And hopefully, you know, uh, when the game's over, that that, uh, the, that the Barracudas will be uh, on top. They're a little bit uh, a team that makes you nervous. They've, uh, you know, they've had this year about four games where they've, they've lost badly and they've come back and played well the next week. And of course, last week they didn't play well down in Shreveport to get beat badly. Uh, they had three different special team plays that went for touchdowns against them and some things. So I just, uh, we've, we've got to take care of our own business, do what we need to do and uh, execute properly and uh, uh, not worry about what which Winnipeg team's going to come in here, whether it's a good one or the bad one. Also tonight, the Baltimore Stallions, coming off only their second loss of the season, will play host to Memphis, although the Mad Dogs have had very little fight as of late, losing their last two games and falling at three and four. They will also be without downtown Eddie Brown, which really hurts Damon Allen and his struggling offense. This game also features three of the better pass rushers in the Canadian Football League in Alfred Payton, Tim... Four-time MVP award winner Doug Flutie is having another spectacular season. He is the straw that stirs the stamps. Once the game was over and I'd gotten over a little bit of the frustration, I went to the Grey Cup, watched Darren. I'm his biggest cheerleader. And uh, I was happy for him winning his championship and all that. And then when we got home, the only mention of this game is usually specific plays. Like I'll mention, you know, you had a great catch on the corner route to get down to the five yard line, or why did this happen or that happen? And it was, it's never been anything where it's ribbing or if somebody has one up on the other. Uh, I mean, we had beaten them 11 straight times up until that game. And, you know, the conversations were all the, still the same of specific plays of what he did or what I did, not who won and who lost. It's frustrating for us. I mean, you know, I've been here three years. We have one Grey Cup ring, but the last two years we've come up short. Um, we've been very consistent throughout our regular seasons, and we win or we have won all the games that we're supposed to win. And then when it gets down to the tough games, you win 50% of those and you wind up 15 and three. Um, you know, if, if you win 50% of your games in the playoffs, you wind up going home. you got to win 100% of them. And that's, that's the difference. We've got to win the right two, three games. I try to worry, concern myself with staying efficient throwing the ball and cutting down on interceptions and scoring points. Then as a result of that, each week, the numbers end up pretty decent, and you do that over an 18-week season, and boom, at the end of the year, you've got a 6,000-yard passing season and all these touchdown passes, all that stuff kind of happens as a result. Uh, Stu Laird has been real good at keeping me up to date on where I stand. <laughs> it's like every week, Doug, you, you went ahead of this person, you went, you know, this guy, or you're 10,000 yards away from him, or 5,000, and uh, Stu's always uh, sort of kept me up to date on the career stuff, because I had no clue. Uh, I've played here six years, and I just wish, kind of looking back at it now, I wish I had those first four or five years where I was down south, if I had been playing up here, what I possibly could have been doing. 
as far as getting a legitimate opportunity to get your butt out on the field and pull the trigger, uh, you're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait behind someone, hope someone gets banged up or doesn't play well. Or, and I'm, I'm 32 years old. I'm enjoying myself. Right now, I think it's more about enjoying myself than making those kind of moves. Uh, plus, financially, with a salary cap, they're not going to pay back up quarterbacks what I can make up here. You know what? I don't think Doug Flutie was enjoying himself in the first half of this contest. His team is down. He did rally them for a late touchdown. They're now down by nine. We're going to take another break. When we come back, we will review our game story. Gordon Glenn will give us their first half thoughts. It is 24 to 15. Surprise, surprise, the Texans with the lead. Stay tuned. We're back in a moment. Basically reads like this. Doug Flutie tosses his 14th touchdown pass of the season late in the contest to Dave Sapunjas to cut into the lead. Flutie with 136 yards passing, one INT as well. Sapunjas and Pitts, the super slot backs, well, they've been relatively quiet. Four receptions for the two, a combination of 37 yards and one TD. You can tell the protections are really keying on them. Lucas with a huge 105-yard punt return for a touchdown, which sets a new team record for the Texans. And Jimmy Kemp, he's getting the job done. Surprise starter today. He did win last week, 10 of 14. He had 100 yards and one touchdown. Looked extremely impressive running the offense and running the ball as well. Let's go back to the Alladome where Gordon Glenn are standing by. Your thoughts on the first half? Well, really, Darren, there's two thoughts here about a touchdown that happened and one that didn't. Let's talk about first the one that didn't, the 75-yard interception return for a touchdown by Marvin Coleman, called back by a penalty. That was huge. Oh, huge play for Calgary because it was a 10-point swing. San Antonio turned around and kicked a field goal after the play. Marvin Coleman takes it to the house after the interception. Ken Leonard got the penalty that calls it back. That's a big swing. The David Lucas 105-yard punt return, the second longest in the CFL this year. Gary Rogers has the longest in Hamilton. That just electrified this crowd and this team. Yeah, it really did. And it gave San Antonio the momentum, and they took that momentum to get the lead in this first half. Jeff, Jim Kemp has been doing a nice job of mixing up the plays, getting Mike Saunders involved, which he should, and right now they have momentum. And, of course, we'll keep an eye on Doug Flutie and whatever it was that happened to the thumb on his throwing hand. Darren? Texans have a 24-15 lead over the Calgary Stampeders, and young Jim Kemp has been a major part of that. He's passed for 100 yards. Doug Flutie has more yards passing. Most of them came, though, on that last drive. Each team has turned the ball over once, and each time it's resulted in points for the other side. In fact, it led to touchdowns for each team. And the punt return of 105 yards by David Lucas is the one that that is not reflected there. But Doug Flutie had just 62 yards passing in the first quarter. He comes up with 70 more in the in the second. But Doug Flutie was shaking that right thumb. He appeared to be all right warming up here, so there doesn't seem to be any issue about him continuing in this football game. There's really not much they can do. They'll go in there and take a look at the thumb of Doug Flutie's, and the trainers will take a look, possibly put a little bit of ice on it to try and contain any swelling in that thumb, but really not a lot you can do in this game. Just have a Tylenol and get back in there. Now for the Calgary Stampeders, a major story this season has been their defense. In six games this year, the Stampeders have allowed an average of only three points in the second half. And today, the second quarter, 24 today, 84 in the season. Contrast that with the fact that they've only allowed 20 points in the second half all season long. San Antonio will get a chance to make a dent in that number as we begin the second half. And it's David Lucas again who jumps out across the 35 to the 38-yard line, and that's where the San Antonio Texans will begin the second half. Jimmy Kemp, the last second replacement for David Archer, went 10 for 14 for 100 yards and one touchdown. They're not numbers that'll get you in the Hall of Fame, but he played the way you have to against the Calgary defense. They're numbers that'll get you the lead in a football game against the number one team. Let's remind everybody, this is the Calgary Stampeders that haven't lost yet in 1995. And on first down, Kemp goes to work in the shotgun. And Kemp quickly gets it up for Mike Saunders over the wide receiver position, and Saunders out across the 45 to the 48 for a gain of eight.
It's just a little screen pass by Saunders. Used to take a good look at Matt Finley, who's playing that middle linebacker position. Used to playing the will linebacker, but he flows out to the ball. Gets involved in the tackle there, along with Alondra Johnson, who also shows good range to get out there. But Mr. Consistency, Matt Finley, and he's really taken to that middle linebacker position well. He's playing well in the middle. The will linebacker? Oh, weak side linebacker. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you changed his name on <laughs> Second and a yard. Well, they give second down to the fullback, Tony Burst. And Burst runs into <laughs> Stu Laird. Laird knocks him back. He should have the first down, though after a pickup of three yards. And the report from the Calgary bench is that Doug Flutie has an elbow problem. It is not considered to be serious, and he should continue the rest of the way. We saw him shake the hand a couple of times in that first half. Yeah, it looked like it was a thumb, but uh, good news for Calgary that it is an elbow, a little bit of a bruise in the elbow, so he'll be okay. Now on first down from their own 50. And the give goes back to Saunders. Saunders, Saunders. jumps over the pile and gets up to the 53-yard line. A pickup of three yards. And the San Antonio Texans go into the type of offense we've seen them play all year long. The number one rushing team in the Canadian Football League, averaging 131 yards a game. In 1995 projections for Mike Saunders, 1,545 yards on the ground. That's a lot of yards. This guy wants the ball back. His team, he's not used to standing on the side. We talked about it early in the game. The way to beat the Calgary Stampeders is to keep Doug Flutie right where he is in that pitcher, standing on the sideline. Now on second and seven, Kemp from the shotgun. Dumps it off for Saunders. His helmet came off, and Saunders dives out to the 49-yard line. Should be a first down for San Antonio, but... He literally faked Anthony McClanahan right out of his helmet. Well, you know, it was just leg strength by Mike Saunders because he's going to go out in the flat and get a good shot of it right here. Watch McClanahan. Big hit. And Saunders just stands there solidly, takes a hit. McClanahan, the other part of that play that you didn't see is without his helmet, Chase Saunders down the sideline. The game was eight at first and ten San Antonio at the Calgary 49. Kemp, quick drop, looking out to the flat for Burst. That pass yes, might have been tipped in the line of scrimmage. And it'll bring up second down. Well, those linebackers are nuts. You're going to run in there and get involved without a helmet on. <laughs> I remember Dan Kepley breaking his jaw once in a game when the trainers had to actually physically hide his helmet to prevent him from going back on the field. That's how much he wanted to play. They are crazy. And he almost jumped into a tackle there without his hat. McClanahan. What a start to the season he has. Wally Bono thinks he is a legitimate great linebacker in this league. He remains out there now. It's second and ten, San Antonio. From the Calgary 49. And Kemp from the shotgun. Stands in over the middle and gets it there for Billy Hess. is close to another first down as he's collared at the Calgary 39-yard line. And depending on the spot, he'll be very close to a first down. It looks like he's about a yard short. Kemp sees man-to-man, -man and Hess has got a little bit of separation on Gerald Vaughn coming across the middle. The crossing pattern's always the toughest. Looks like he all got away with a little bit of a face mask there, did Vaughn, but crossing pattern always the toughest to cover for a defensive back because you get across the field and then, and this Canadian Football League field 65 yards wide. That's a lot of ground to try and catch up to a guy. What's amazing about the San Antonio Texans is that all four of their starting receivers are in their first year in the CFL. And all pretty much what they call possession-type receivers. Run good patterns, precise patterns, have excellent hands. And then when you add David Lucas, that gives them the speed they want. So they got a nice balance in the receiving core now with the addition of Lucas. Has got 10 yards and a San Antonio first down to the Calgary 39. San Antonio leading the game 24-15, just underway in the second half. They give it back to Saunders. Saunders looking for a block. Won't get one that time. McClanahan kept his hat on and stuffed Saunders for a loss of one. A little bit of a payback there for McClanahan who comes up and fills the hole nicely and makes a play on Mike Saunders after putting the big hit on him earlier and bouncing off him. Anthony McClanahan was with Calgary late last year, didn't get on the roster, went to the World League and suffered a finger injury so severe they thought they'd have to amputate the ring finger on his right hand. They are able to put some pins in it and save the finger. 
And now you know what he wears, even though he had that injury? A little bit of tape around that. Yeah. His linebackers are nuts. That'll help. <laughs> Second down, Kemp looking for the bundle for Kralik. And Kralik kind of turned the wrong way. He was covering the play by Al Jordan. So Jim Kemp airs one out on second down, but we'll see Roman Anderson and the field goal unit. Let's talk about what happened at the end of the first half when it appeared that San Antonio tried a fake field goal. You're not so sure it was a fake. No, I'm not so sure it was because I really didn't see any receivers for San Antonio down the field. So either Kemp didn't get a good handle on the football, didn't feel comfortable with the hold, and didn't want to get it blocked, or someone made a mistake and didn't release for San Antonio on the fake. But didn't look to me like it was a called fake. Here's Anderson now from the 47-yard line. The NCAA's all-time leading scorer. And Anderson puts it up and through. 27-15, San Antonio leads Calgary in the third quarter at the Alamo Dome. We'll come back and chat with Stampede and owner Larry Rickman right after this. Antonio Spurs were preparing to play a basketball game when all of a sudden the sprinklers came on. I know it gets hot in Texas, but this was a little bit ridiculous. It has not been an offensive flood thus far for the Texans, but they are playing very, very well. They still have the lead in this football contest. We keep waiting for Calgary to come back. They'll get the ball back right away. There you see the cannons. Let's go back to our big cannon, Gord Miller. <laughs> Yeah, my cannon's a little rusty today, Darren. I'm hobbled by a coal, but you see the water cannons, which thus far have not gone off today at this Canadian Football League game. First and 10, the Calgary Stampeders start from their own 35 after the 42-yard field goal by Roman Anderson. And Flutie on first down, rolls out quickly, gets it to Tony Stewart, and Stewart has a first down and then some finally forced out of bounds at midfield, and there's a flag down on the play. We're delighted to have with us today Larry Rickman, the owner of the Calgary Stampeders. Dan Peters, you still own them, right? I still own them, Gordon. Now, what's the deal? We, we, we were talking about the sale of the Stan Peters, it seems like, for months now. What's the deal? It's really dragged on and dragged on. I, I really don't know what's going to happen. In the, in the meantime, I still own it. We're going Stand on as business as, as, as usual with the Stamps, and if, if something happens, we'll, we'll be the first to uh, let you know. There's lots going on in the Canadian Football League. A lot of people are keeping an eye on how the American-based teams are doing. They've got a good crowd here in San Antonio today. What is the CFL doing, perhaps, to, to help out its U.S.-based team? Well, I think it's come slowly but surely. Uh, clearly, um, you know, teams starting up have have had difficulty learning how to how, how to run teams. There there aren't many of the new owners that have that have owned sports teams previously, so so that's made it a bit uh, tougher for them. Flutie gets it out to Tony Stewart again. He's got another first down to the 27-yard line. There was a face masking call in that previous play that moved the Stampeders 15 yards closer. That time the game was 13 and another first down. What about the name? Canadian Football League. There's been so much talk about calling the North American Football League. Continental Football League would be perhaps my choice. Gord, I'm, I'm born in born in Canada. I, I'd like to see it stay as the uh, CFL. Simple as that. Hey, hey, I hear you. That's <laughs> what I like to hear. <laughs> First and ten, Flutie has time. Has a man over the middle, Sapunjas. And Sapunjas just about got his head taken off by Jason Wallace. As Sapunjas went over the middle, and Wallace almost made him pay. I tell you, Wallace is sitting in his own defense. When you're in zone, receivers have to find the hole and settle down because if you keep running through the zone, you're going to run into someone else's. And Jason Wallace was just sitting there waiting. Right at the top of your screen, you'll see Sapunjas coming across. Flutie leads him into it, and Jason puts a big. Uh, Jason Wallace puts a big hit on Sapunjas. No catch. Second and ten for Flutie and the Stampeder. Lots of time for the Calgary quarterback. He gets it up top there for Alan Pitts, who has his legs cut out from under him, but Pitts is close to another Stampeder first down. Now, Larry, I know you're a superstitious guy. What you wear, everything else. We'll talk about that in a second, but first of all, we'll take a look at what happened to Alan Pitts on that last catch. Well, they go back to the man-to-man, -man, and when you get man-to-man, -man, you got the number one receiver in the Canadian Football League in Alan Pitts. That's the guy you go to. But San Antonio's been doing a nice job of coverage on these great receivers for Calgary. Gain of eight brings up third and two, and the Stampeders will try a field goal for Mark McLaughlin. I know you're superstitious, Larry, so what did you do differently today? Your team's down by 12. <laughs> I don't know, Gord. Uh, you know, we, we are a very intense team, and we like to win, and uh, every little thing we can do, some of the guys put, put one of the socks on first rather than the other, and there's a bunch of these little, little rituals. We're just here to win. It's as simple as that. Mark McLaughlin from the 26-yard line has not missed from inside the 50 this year. And 
and he continues the streak, 16 for 16. And his team creeps a little closer, 27-18 the score. We'll have more from San Antonio right after this. In offensive categories and seven defensive categories. And look how they've dominated their opposition so far this year, running up their 6-0 record. What's amazing about all that, Larry Rickman, is that it almost happened here in San Antonio. This was almost your home stadium. Well, it came very, very close, but the, the people of, um, of Calgary, when they realized how uh, serious the situation was, rallied and bought, bought tickets, and we're just proud to be there for the 50th year, and it's our, our plan to be there for 50 more. Now, does running up regular season wins like this make you nervous? We want to be 18 and 0. It's as simple as that. I mean, we have we have goals, and uh, you know, keeping the intensity up is very, very important. But candidly, the big the big win of the year is clearly those those uh, finals, and uh, you know, we're just going to do our best until we get there. Well, they did away with the Western final this year, so you'll have to contend yourself with a North Division final. A final is a final. <laughs> I just hope the weather's decent and. Uh, and the, sideline and it looked like Coleman tried to jam Kralik and just missed. Now he's playing with a bit of a cracked wrist and that'll come into it when it's time to get your hands on the receiver and try to jam him up. Wally Buono said that Joe Kralik reminds him very much of Jim Sandusky. Maybe a little bigger but a possession type guy who runs tremendous pass runs. That's his first catch of the football game. He came in as the CFL's fifth leading receiver. On first down for the 25. The game goes back to Saunders, trying to get around the corner. He bounced away from the first man, but then that man just jumped on his back, and Alondra Johnson persevered to make the stop. Larry, there's a lot of talk about the Grey Cup, of course, this year it's in Regina, and uh, perhaps about holding it down to the U.S. It'll be in Baltimore soon. What about here in San Antonio? Uh, I, I could definitely see it there in the future, uh, but candidly, I think I think Saskatchewan is going to be the, one of the best ever. Uh, that's that's a town that has loved their uh, football for 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 years, and uh, I'd like to see it go back and forth between Canada and, and the U.S. We don't want to lose lose touch with the national game. Lost him a couple on that last play. Mark it is second and 13. Kip, lots of time. Delivers it to Kralik, and he just couldn't get to it. The pass just out of his reach as Greg Frers, the sixth defensive back, was in on the coverage. Take a look at here what San Antonio is going to do to McClenahan coming up. This is the new guy in here. Let's see what... I'll get a little bit of holding. Is that holding? Okay, okay, a lot of holding. And the ref is right there. <laughs> oh, no, he just gave Larry Rickman the free oh, shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he just saw the replay. He's not happy of it In right fact, now. Larry Rickman right now, he's typing a memo to the lead. <laughs> Roman Anderson will try this from 35 yards out. Perfect today and over 90% on the season. As is Mark McLaughlin, the CFL's top two field goal kickers here today. They're playing true to form. Anderson puts it up and good and restores his team's lead. 30 to 18, the San Antonio Texans lead the Calgary Stampede. Twenty foot baskets. Three hundred point games. One hundred yard courts. In the future, athletes will make the game faster, farther, tougher. But today's athlete can choose new all sport. Fluid replacement, unsurpassed taste, four thirst quenching flavors. All sport is a body quencher. So before it gets to this, new all sport, the game will never be the same. Our favorite product is a new product we just put on the market, and it's a Canadian style veggie back bacon. We're creating something totally new that didn't exist before. Long distance is a major expense in our company. The Advantage uh, saving plan is much uh, more competitive, and uh, based on the last four or five years, our prices have come down 35 to 40 percent. And it save us money we can reinvest in R&D and in expanding the distribution of our product. Well, we're back in San Antonio with the owner of the Stampeders, Larry Rickman. Larry, I know you've got some nails to chew and some uh, some ice to work on. Thanks for stopping by today. Thanks. Pleasure to be here, Gordon. Larry Rickman, the owner of the Calgary Stampeders. His team right now trailing 30-18. to 18. I think this is as late as the Calgary Stampeders have ever trailed in a football game this year. Are you the official statistician? Would you know that? 
He... Uh, it feels like it. it just <laughs> even if it's not, it feels like it, I can tell you that. <laughs> All right, Larry, thanks very much. The Calgary Stampeders after the field goal by Anderson will start at their own 35-yard line. And Doug Flutie, the offense, getting to work. And Larry Rickman, Glenn, pointed out to us in the break, hey, a couple of touchdowns are right back in it. Oh, yeah. When you have number 20 in your lineup, you can be down four or five touchdowns and still be in it. So it's a long way from being over. On first down, Flutie fakes to Tony Stewart. Steps up. Here comes the rush. He got away from his own man. Got a great block by Pee Wee Smith. And now Flutie slides down the 42-yard line with Jason Wallace coming up. What a block by Pee Wee Smith to spring Doug Flutie for a gain of seven. It was a great block by Smith. You're right. And Pee Wee's not a big guy. And he's coming across and hitting David Harper. You'll see Flutie take off, get to the outside, and right to the left of your screen. You just saw his feet. But Pee Wee came up and put the key block right on David Harper and, and took him out. <laughs> Pee Wee Smith still looking for his first touchdown of the season. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Game was seven at second and three. Flutie on the option. Gives it off to Stewart. Another great block by Pitts. And Stewart lost the football, but they're saying he got it back. He's down the Calgary 50-yard line, a gain of nine, and another Stampeder first down. Yeah, that was right in front of our uh, right in front of our bench, and I hear the whistle. No fumble. And Tony Stewart. As a gain of nine, we talked a moment ago about no touchdowns for Pee Wee Smith. Look at the guys with lots of catches and no scores. Nick Mazzoli and Shalon Baker from Edmonton each have 29 catches and no touchdowns. Pee Wee Smith, 20 receptions this year, no touchdowns. He went the first 15 weeks of the season last year without catching a touchdown pass. On first down, the ball goes to Pee Wee. He'll need to get a long way to score on that play. He's out at the 55-yard line, and it's a gain of five. Really was an all-star team of receivers right there when you see all those guys who haven't gotten the end zone. Pee Wee got a nice catch right there underneath the zone for Doug Flutie, and they're still having trouble getting the ball down the field. This is an offense that likes to throw deep and get the ball to pits down the field, but San Antonio's doing a nice job of making them throw it underneath. Now the wide receivers can be the forgotten men for the Calgary Stampede. They mark it as a gain of four, second and six. Lots of time for Flutie. Steps up, and he has it there to Vince Danielson, and Danielson down to the San Antonio 46-yard line has another Calgary first down. Good catch by Danielson. He's playing that five receivers. A lot of times will be Sapunjas and Pitts as the slotbacks. Danielson comes in as the fifth receiver, and comes up with a good catch. The reason it was is because he fought for the football. The simultaneous catch goes to the offense, and Danison did a nice job of fighting for that one. And you see the Calgary receivers talking to Doug Flutie as he's calling the play. The communication between the receivers and the quarterback is uncanny in Calgary. Now Flutie backing up, looking for Pitts over the middle, almost intercepted by the safety Charles Franks. Alan Pitts got a hand on the football. And it just bounced away from Charles Franks, who last week had an interception return of 65 yards to set up a big touchdown in San Antonio's win over Memphis. And right after the throw, Doug Flutie touched himself and said, that's my fault, because Pitts did a nice job of coming across the middle, but Flutie just threw it a little bit behind, and Flutie just touched his shoulder pad and said, that was my fault, let's do it again. And you can see the San Peters have gone to hand signals now to try to combat the crowd noise. On second down, Flutie for Pitt, same play. This time he makes the catch, and he has a first down for the San Antonio 29-yard line. It was exactly the same play. This time, with more pressure on him, Doug Flutie comes up with the perfect throw to Pitts as he finds the hole in front of safety Charles Franks. But James King had put some serious pressure on Doug Flutie, and as he was falling back with the pressure of King right in his face, he got the ball off. You see, right there, it's a zone defense because he finds the hole in front of the safety Franks. Catches the ball, first down for Calgary. The San Antonio 30. Here comes Tony Stewart. Stewart puts his head down and fights his way down to about the 25-yard line. And the aforementioned James King helped make the stop along with George Bethune. A lot of people always ask, you know, when the things are going good downfield as far as the passing game, why throw in a running play like that to get you one yard? 
it's super important to keep the run involved. Even if you're a passing team like Calgary, you have to keep the running game involved or those linebackers for the San Antonio Texans can start taking deeper drops and messing up pass routes for the Stamps. Got a San Antonio player down on the field. Looks like Willie Fears, the fourth-year CFL player out of Northwestern State. And while we have a minute, let's remind you about our next game here on TSN. It comes your way from Sky Dome. The BC Lions and the Toronto Argonauts, they hooked up in a classic earlier this season at the stadium at BC Place. 4.30 Pacific, 7.30 Eastern as the game comes your way from Toronto. Should be an interesting game. Lions in that real tough part of their schedule where they have three games in ten days and the Argonauts obviously struggling right now. Be an interesting game. Willie Fears is the injured San Antonio Texan. And as he wakes his way off the football field, he's replaced by number 96, Oscar Giles. I hope he didn't hurt his hand because you know, you know what this big guy does? Plays the piano and sings. Huh? Yeah, he's a piano player. <laughs> oh, the broken finger could be catastrophic. Yeah. Game was five and second and five. Flutie rolling out. Got Pitts and Pitts short of the first down as he stops at the 21. And now Wally Buana will have an interesting decision to make as Calgary will have a full yard to go for the first down. Boy, Pitts is drawing a crowd. You'll see him running the, the out pattern right here. It's a zone, because when you see a zone, it's linebackers will pass him off. But look at the crowd that Pitts draws. One, two, three, four San Antonios around him. The CFL's number one and number two receivers. Sapunjas has one catch for a touchdown. Nice average. Pitts has six receptions. Calgary's gambling on third and a yard. The short yardage team is not in. Option for Stewart. He's got a ways to go, but he just got there. He was almost stuck well short of the first down. As getting in there was Roosevelt Collins, number 56, and he almost stopped Tony Stewart three yards behind the line of scrimmage. Well, credit Tony Stewart for that first down and what may be the biggest play of the game for the Calgary Stampeders. You'll see Leonard Nelson flowing to the football. You mentioned Roosevelt Collins up in there in the backfield. Nelson makes the tackle after the first down, but Collins had him dead to rights in the backfield. Stewart made him miss. And gets the first down on his own. Tenth play of the drive. Flutie with lots of time. Now he's off and running. And tripped up down around the 15-yard line. And Flutie with that wonky elbow won't want to do that too much. Leonard Nelson reached the arm out and tripped him up after a gain of five. That was coverage downfield because Kenny Wilhite and Malcolm Frank had the blanket on the right side of the Stamps offense. And Flutie had nowhere to go, had to scramble and get what he could. The game was five, second and five as time winds down here in the third quarter. Calgary trailing it by 12. Four receivers from the wide side of the field. Flutie dumps it off underneath for Tony Stewart. Incomplete. Third down coming up for the Stampeders. A little bit of a change up for San Antonio. We've seen Tom Gearhart in coverage all night on Sapunjas. Now they send Gearhart right up the middle on the stunt. He's untouched. You'll see him 45 right there. That causes the pressure on Doug Flutie. He has to throw it when he's not ready to and can't find Stewart. It's the final play of the third quarter. The Calgary Stampeders will try a field goal on the opening play of the fourth. 30-18, to 18, San Antonio leads the Calgary Stampeders. Welcome back to CFL Control. It is once again a very busy day in the world of sports and a lot of attention being focused on golf. The third round of the PGA Championship continues to be played. Now going into today's round, Ernie Els and Mark O'Meara were tied for the lead. Both guys sitting at 11 under par. This is Els. Third hole out of the bunker. He drains it for the birdie. He would fall to 12 under par. But Marco Mira has bounced back with a couple of birdies himself. He now sits at 13 under par. 
He's played 10 so far. Ernie also playing 10 rounds or 10 holes, I should say. Maggard's in there, Haas, Elkington. We'll take a break. Back in a moment. Stay tuned. Round 10 of the 1995 Formula One World Championship makes its way to Budapest for the Hungarian Grand Prix. An informative pre-race show ignites the action, followed by the Green Light Live, Sunday morning on Real TV TSN. to San Antonio, where the Texans lead the Calgary Stampeders 30-18. The Stampeders are lining up a field goal try. You think this is a good time to try a fake? Well, this is the type of time that you would think it would happen because you're in between quarters. You have lots of time to go over there and sort of organize it on the sideline, and that would be a huge play for Calgary at this point. But you were mentioning that Wally's more likely to just take the points in this case. Wally Buono is more likely to take the three. It is third and five for the Calgary Stampeders. They're down at the 15-yard line. Mark McLaughlin is perfect inside the 50 this year. He's 16 for 16. This try will come from the 22-yard line. And this to pull the Calgary Stampeders within nine points. Rudy gets a chance and McLaughlin puts it through. And the score now, 30-21 to 21 in favor of the San Antonio Texans over the Calgary Stampeders. But for Calgary, you have to think it would be disappointing after putting together an 11-play drive to see it finish with a field goal. Well, first of all, for San Antonio, you have Jim Kemp who comes in and takes away pretty much the whole third quarter with a great drive of his own, keeping uh, Doug Flutie on the sideline. There we go. <laughs> Some Calgary fans made the trip down to San Antonio. We understand they had a good time. Saw some of them in the hotel earlier today getting their faces painted up. And, of course, for those who didn't know what this game was all about, they were looking at them like they were somewhat strange. Got to ask you, you talk about the long quarter and the short quarter. We'll talk about that in a moment. First and ten for the San Antonio Texans from the 35. Camp with the fake by the receiver screen. Now the screen the other way to Saunders. And he's stopped by Anthony McClanahan for a gain of a couple. And the numbers through three quarters show Calgary still with an edge in the passing department and San Antonio held to just 43 yards rushing. But the fourth, the second and the fourth quarters are what's called the long quarters. Why? Well, you have stop time for one. And uh, the last two minutes, it's stop time. So after every play, the clock stops. And that, that extends the quarter. You actually end up getting about 10 more plays at least out of the second and fourth. So in the long quarter now for the San Antonio Texans on second and long. Kemp out of the backfield for Saunders. He's going to try to make something out of this, can he? No. Stop at the 41-yard line. A good job by Streckos as a Kovic. And Kenny Walker to hustle downfield and limit his gain to four. Kay Stevenson will be forced to set his punting unit out in the field. Boy, it really is a good job for those offensive linemen. We talked earlier about when you have to pass rush and you're hitting heads and fighting, arm fighting with an offensive lineman, and then to fly out there and also have to make the tackle on the running back, that, that's tough. Kemp would have liked to seen that one work a little bit better, but... He's doing a nice job for San Antonio in, replace, in replacing Archer. Todd Jordan back out to punt with Pee Wee Smith and Terry Vaughn to receive. Great kick by Jordan. Chases Vaughn back to the 25. And Vaughn gets out to the 34-yard line before he is stopped on the play by Oscar Giles. The Calgary Stampeders trail by nine. We're early in the fourth quarter in San Antonio. Antonio Texans is 45-year-old Joe Ferguson, who last played in the NFL in 1990 for the Indianapolis Colts, but he's best known for being a Buffalo Bill, where he played for Kay Stevenson. In all, Joe Ferguson spent 17 years in the National Football League as a quarterback. Now, here comes the story, Glenn. Are you ready for this? In 1973, when Joe Ferguson broke into the NFL, he was a backup quarterback to Jack Kemp. This guy, Jimmy Kemp, was a year old. <laughs> now, Joe Ferguson backs up Jack Kemp's son. Wow, that's amazing. One year old when his dad was playing with that guy right there. 
He started his NFL career when Richard Nixon was the president there's of the a, United States. Sorry, but there's a trivia question in the, in the paper here. Who did uh, Ferguson have in his backfield in Buffalo? There's the swing pass out to Terry Vaughn, and that is going nowhere. Speaking of backfield, as jumping up to make the stop was Jason Wallace, who says, yeah, I got him. Terry Vaughn has been running a little bit of that tailback position with Stewart having some problems with his arm, but gets a swing pass, and Gearhart's out there, and Wallace is out there, and good pursuit by San Antonio. The loss was seven. I'm saying O.J. Simpson and the electric company. You're right. By the way. O.J. Simpson. Ferguson was the quarterback that year that Simpson had 2,003 yards rushing. Second and 17 for Calgary. Big down for the Stampeders. Clooney up over the top. He's got Pitts. And Pitts has a first down and Newsome all the way down to the San Antonio 47-yard line. A huge first down for Calgary on the gain of 35 yards. And you start to get the feeling with Allen Pitts in your lineup that you can't keep him away from that deep ball for very long. Sooner or later, he's going to get open, and here he happens with a man-to-man -man coverage with Jason Wallace. Pitts gets open. And I'm sure that San Antonio noticed that Doug Flutie was holding the elbow. They were not expecting a deep ball there. Flutie up over the middle for Vince Danielson. A great grab down the San Antonio 35-yard line. Should be a first down for the Calgary Stampeders. You see Flutie trying to get that elbow loose. It's a pickup of 12 yards. You can see how Calgary has done in the second half, outscoring its opponents 92 to 20 in the second half. And remember, the Stampeders have allowed only six points in the fourth quarter all year. On first down, Flutie up for pick. The pass is over his head. Jason Wallace there on the coverage. Jason Wallace had pits on that deep ball, but he had pretty nice coverage on this one. Pitts is just going to run the curl pattern, and Wallace has him in man to man. See, Pitts trying to get inside position, just turn around. Wallace keeps working back to the ball, and when you're trying to reach around a receiver, you try and pull that right hand down so you can only try to catch the ball with one. Second and ten for Calgary. Flutie has to get up under center. Here comes the rush. Look out, Flutie's in trouble. He is dropped. Doug Flutie goes down hard. Dave Harper threw him down. And a huge defensive play by the San Antonio defense. Roosevelt Collins had some pressure. And David Harper comes up with the sack. But tell you what, the key to this play is crowd noise. How many times is Flutie? the center he's more comfortable in the shotgun and he can see the field better in the shotgun he has to get under the center because the crowd noise he drops back can't see because of those big guys in front of him holds the ball a little too long and in comes David Harper to clean things up and get Flutie on the ground it was a loss of 10 on the play it'll bring on Mark McLaughlin in the field goal unit McLaughlin from 52 yards out now his only miss this year was from outside the 50. McLaughlin gets it up and puts it through. Big points for the Calgary Stampeders after the sack by San Antonio. Calgary down by six with 10-18 to play in the fourth quarter. Three hundred acres in Alberta, around a quarter million dollars. The Bic Lighter, around a dollar nine. What do they have in common? They're both worth every penny. Imagine, adhesive so strong they help hold together 100 tons of soaring transportation. Imagine a fabric so bright it lets you see an accident in time to prevent it. Imagine a single disc so powerful it can store almost everything imaginable and protect it for a lifetime. These products and thousands more that make our lives better exist because the people at 3M imagine. I know it sounds crazy, but yeah, I took the high endurance challenge from Old Spice because I didn't really think it could work better than my old deodorant, but it does. It evaporates less quickly, it also lasts longer, 
High endurance protects against odor better. So if you still think every deodorant works the same, take the challenge. Try high endurance from Old Spice. Because now you got proof. Guaranteed. Faster than a speeding base runner. As close to the action as an umpire's call. It's television. Real television. Bringing you the Expos and the Phillies tonight on TSN. Danny McManus and the BC Lions are 6-1. and one. They'll take on the Toronto Argonauts on Monday at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. If Calgary loses today, it's a chance for the BC Lions to take temporary possession of first place in the North Division. You look at the Argos and it's... Poorly as, they, as they've played in the last couple of games and Saskatchewan start and Ottawa start in that North Division, those bottom four teams still have a chance to make the playoffs because that last team goes over to the uh, south side in the playoff race. And here the focus is on Jimmy Kemp and the San Antonio Texans. Four and three coming into this game and Jake Ireland's having to talk it over with the folks upstairs. I think they're discussing the 22nd clock. There's been a couple of times in the game where the 22nd clock has been late starting. Well, here in San Antonio, they're used to, with the college football in here, they're used to the 42nd clock. Jake Ireland is a customer service manager for a steel company in Hamilton. So Jake took a day off work to come out here yesterday. Jim Kemp completing 69.5% of his passes. He has 46 coming in, so that's a lot better. Here's the give to the lead back, Tony Burse, and not much doing there as Burse got stopped up by Kenny Walker and Matt Finley. You can sort of feel the momentum of this game sort of turning, turning to Calgary Stampeder's side. You know, great first half by San Antonio, but Calgary's come up with some points in the last two possessions and now you see that defense tightening up a little bit on San Antonio and you can feel that momentum shifting. You know what Jake was talking about apparently was them putting up the noise sign on the scoreboard here. Apparently that's not allowed. On second and nine, Kemp's in trouble. McClanahan's got him down for 20. The ball is loose and Robert Johnson is in the end zone touchdown. Well, Jimmy Kemp looked down to a play but they're saying it's a fumble. A 20-yard return for Anthony McClanahan, pardon me, the sack by McClanahan, and Alondra Johnson with the touchdown. It's San Antonio's league-leading 16th fumble of the year. And in the blocking scheme, Tony Burst is responsible for McClanahan, and he can't get there. He lined up to the wrong side of the field, couldn't get there. McClanahan beat him to the sack, strips the ball. Alondra Johnson picks it up and walks in the end zone, but what a huge play defensively for these Calgary Stampeders. Alondra Johnson with the touchdown and a good call by the officials. Jimmy Kemp was not down. And so now Calgary tied at 30 with the point after the cup. There, Eric was right. A couple of touchdowns, you're right back in it. McLaughlin puts it up and through, and suddenly this crowd in San Antonio sits in stunned silence as Alondra Johnson scores the touchdown to give his team a one-point lead over San Antonio. I'm going to show you what happens right here. This is Tony Burst right here. Now, he's responsible to pick up the blitz. He's got to get over to this side of the field and get McClenahan. We'll just see what happens here. He can't see him in time and can't get there. Oh. McClenahan outruns him. Kemp doesn't have a chance. He gets the ball stripped. Doesn't even know he's back there. Londra Johnson picks it up for the big, big turnover and touchdown. You know, these Calgary Stampeders, offensively, they have all those weapons, and people have talked about their defense only allowing 100 points, but they always find a way to come back on you. Alondra Johnson's fourth career touchdown in the Canadian Football League. That's more than some offensive player. The Calgary Stampeders have the lead over San Antonio, 31 to 30, with 9-12 to play in the fourth. 
San Antonio and Kay Stevenson a little hot after seeing his offense give up a touchdown. You know, and people have criticized Kay Stevenson about not adapting to the CFL quickly enough. He came in in 93 with Sacramento and said, who needs motion? And of course, you know how important motion is in the CFL, but I'll tell you what, he can recognize talent. When he was in Buffalo, he brought in Jim Kelly, Bruce Smith, Andre Reed, and Daryl Talley. How about that for talent? Here's Lucas taking the kick off of the 17-yard line. He's got a punt return for a touchdown, and look out, he gets all the way to the 48-yard line before Raymond Biggs stopped him up. And David Lucas, you talked about bringing speed to the lineup. He's done that and then some to these special teams for the San Antonio Texans. Lucas won a Super Bowl ring with Dallas back in 1993. Number one receiver for Shreveport last year, and has the great speed. They have a lot of possession receivers in Kalick and Stock and Taylor and Hess, but with Lucas, they get that speed. Well, now a big offensive series for the San Antonio Texans. And they start at their own 48, thanks to Lucas. The fake to Saunders. Lots of time for Kemp, and he's looking out there for Kittrick Taylor, but the fat pass falls incomplete. Al Jordan was covering on the play in the man-to-man -man defense and was all over him. And nice coverage by Jordan. A couple, couple knockdowns for him in 1995. See, that was the Stamps' problem. Larry Rickman was upstairs in his box there before the uh, fourth quarter started. Now he goes down to the sidelines and he started winning. Well, you know, he's the guy who signs the checks. Yeah. <laughs> so when he's standing down there and kind of looking at you funny, you probably play, turn up your game a little bit. Here's Kemp on second down. He's in trouble, but he somehow got away. Now stops, throws, and there's a man, Mark Stock. Up at the Calgary 53-yard line. It'll be at least a yard short of a first down. Just amazed at the poise of young Jim Kemp in the pocket. You know, he, he gets almost snowed in. Dreko Zizakovic does a nice bull rush, pushing his man right back into Kemp, but he keeps his composure, rolls out, finds a man working back to the sideline and delivers the ball, but it looks like they're going to be well short and going to have to punt. And the crowd booing that decision by Kay Stevenson. You look at the Kemp family. The dad, Jack, was a quarterback. So is Jim. So is Jeff. Hey, their mom must be a heck of a receiver with all those footballs being thrown her way. <laughs> Somebody in that family had to catch all those passes. That's quite a tradition. Got to be in the genes. Todd Jordan is back to punt. Smith and Vaughn back deep to receive. It's a one-hop snap. Jordan gets a tumbling kick away that bounces down around the 20-yard line. Now it's picked up by Pee Wee Smith. There are no flags down. Now there's one down as he's corralled at the 18-yard line. It was a 30-yard punt. No return as... Smith had to jump in and grab that football, but no yards. Looks to be the indication against the San Antonio Texans. No, it's a face mask against San Antonio. That'll be much costlier. But you're right, Gord. It looked like they were in that no yards uh, zone, but... Major foul, face mask, San Antonio number 28, first down. It's on Pee Wee. A face mask occurred on Pee Wee Smith, and you'll see... He picks up the ball, and then he tries to take off to his right, and you'll just see his head whip around yep. right there. And that's where the face mask occurred, and that's a, you know, you got to call that one. That's where someone can really get hurt and grab onto that face mask. Tony Burst was called. Now Calgary first and 10 from its own 34. Flutie for Sapungis, and Sapungis dives up to the 43-yard line. He'll be about a yard short of a Calgary first down after a gain of nine. Well, what a story we've had here today. The Stampeders have outscored the Texans 23-6 in the second half. Alan Pitts was held off the stat sheet until halfway through the second quarter. David Lucas has a 105-yard punt return for a touchdown. And Jimmy Kemp, 18 of 25 yards, or 18 of 25 for 191 yards and a touchdown. And part of the other story has been Doug Flutie and that right elbow, which continues to give him problems. Second down, a yard to go. They give it off to Tony Stewart. I don't know that he got there. No, I don't think so. He's not even, I don't think he's going to be close. I mean, he's back to the original line of scrimmage. If he's lucky, he might have lost a half a yard on that play. Great surge by that front four, Sacramento, uh, San Antonio, excuse me. 
Oh, that's the first. The, the old Sacramento. <laughs> I thought for sure I'd say it first. <laughs> While Stewart came up short, it'll be a, a long yard for the Calgary Stampeders. Now this is a big, big decision, and Wally's going with the punt team. You know, Kay Stevenson elected to kick the ball off, and field position so important in a close game, but watch the surge by that defensive front four for San Antonio, plugging it up there, led by Bethune right up the middle, and mm. no place for Stewart to go. Well, a big stop for the San Antonio defense. Six and a half minutes to play in the fourth quarter. And the crowd's a lot quieter since they haven't been allowed to put the noise sign up on the scoreboard replay. And a good decision by Wally, I think, to punt in this case. You don't want to turn the ball over to San Antonio in this part of the field. Low snap to Martino. And he gets a low driving kick away that gets by David Lucas. He's going to corral this one down around the 15-yard line. And Lucas, with a flag down, gets up to the 25-yard line. That'll be no yards against the Calgary Stampeders after a 51-yard punt by Tony Martino. Boy, Martino should just have people, they should let one guy go every kick, because every time he gets a lot of pressure on him, he booms one. One for 72, that one for 51. And then you saw the no yards call on Alondra Johnson, so they'll tack on another. No yards. Calgary number 29. Five-yard penalty on the bounce. Decline. First down. Craig Brenner is the fullback. And Jim Kemp, 18 of 25 today for the 23-year-old who played his college football at Wake Forest. Not, not real impressive stats, but some key plays at key times have been the story for San Antonio. After six minutes to play now in the fourth quarter, his team trails by a point. Bad snap. Kemp managed to bring it down. And now he's looking deep. He's got Kralik and Kralik dropped the ball. Kralik wanted that ball awkwardly, tried to cradle it, and it bounced up in the air incomplete. Kralik's working down the sideline and... On, on the outside of the field right there is Gerald Vaughn playing the deep zone. He can't get over to the outside, and they try to find the hole right in between the deep guy and number 27, Al Jordan, who was the short guy. Kralik tried to judge his timing. It bounces off his hands. Looked like Al Jordan might have got his hands on that ball and just deflected it past Joe Kralik on the sideline. Al Jordan had the short zone there and did a nice job recovering back. Now on second down, Kemp dumps it up underneath. He's got it there for Billy Hess. Hess dragged down the 25-yard line. Will be 10 yards short of a first down. And San Antonio will be forced to punt with 5.17 to play in the fourth quarter. And what do you do when you have a guy that's giving you a lot of problems throughout a game? Well, you put two guys. Dreco's been in the backfield. Dreco's is a Kovic for quite a bit of the game, so you get a couple guys to pick him up. And Este and Stevenson working both on uh, Zuzikovic. <laughs> One of the hardest hits Streco took this year was in practice when Coach Bob Vespasiani told Kenny Walker to hit the guy who snaps the ball as hard as he could on special teams. Kenny did it to Streco in practice, knocked him right back on the back of his head. You don't expect it in practice. Big punt by Terry Todd Jordan. This is Terry Vaughn from the 35. Vaughn somehow got underneath the cover man and got all the way out to the 50 for a return of 15 yards after a 51-yard punt. Well, there's all kinds of pressure on rookie head coach Mike Farragelli in Toronto. His team takes on the BC Lions in a game we'll have for you Monday at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. He was asked about his team's performance against the Edmonton Eskimos last Wednesday. and all their injured people back. He said, what can I say? We stunk. Yeah, but you know, when you say those injured people back, Gord, I, a lot of those guys, you're talking about Jock Climey and Fairholm and Kent Austin, their number one quarterback, and you got to be playing hurt. Those guys can't be fully healthy because with all that talent, you'd think these guys would be playing a lot better. Mike Dingle, a backup fullback, is the injured San Antonio player. He was injured on that last punt return by Terry Vaughn. What a job by Vaughn to take that back 15 yards. It looked like he ran right underneath people. Yeah, he broke about six tackles. Dingle was one of them. He well, this is this is where the Calgary Stampeders, Glenn, kill you because they get the ball back and Doug Flutie puts together one of those drives 
And just when you think you're in the football game, Flutie can take it away from you. And I'll tell you, this is the other thing where they, they kill you is that they're playing on half the football field. They don't have to drive the distance. In the first half, San Antonio, through their kicking game and good defense, had Flutie driving the length of the field. Now he's got half the field to work with. 267 yards passing for the man who came in with the CFL lead. And Doug Flutie is closing in on 30,000 for his career. Flutie up over the middle for Pitts. What a catch at the San Antonio 38-yard line. Allen Pitts with a diving grab for a Calgary first down. I tell you, Flutie has such a knack of just putting the ball just where Pitts has to sort of slide hook, catch him. And Brady Cavanaugh was covering on the play, and he was sort of standing there like he wanted to make the play, but he couldn't. It was, it was the throw. A 23-yard gain for Alan Pitts gives him 110 for the game. That's his 38th 100-yard receiving game, only three off the CFL record held by Brian Kelly. First down from the 38. Flutie with the fake to Stewart. Gets it off for Pitts. He's getting hot, and Pitts is dragged down on the play by Jason Wallace, stopped at the 32-yard line. Well, that's the luxury that the Calgary Stampeders have. You know, Dave Sapunja's coming into the game was the leading receiver in the CFL. Now, you can do a lot of things to Sapunja, double-team him. If you have one receiver, that's your big go-to guy. But with Calgary, they have so many weapons. They, if Sapunja's discovered, they go to Pitts, they got their wideouts, and then Tony Stewart gets involved. Five. It's second and five. Flutie out to the flat for Dave Sapungus, and Sapungus dives across the 25-yard line to the 23. He's got a Calgary first down, and he did it with one shoe. <laughs> and we're at the three-minute warning now in San Antonio. Well, when they write up the football encyclopedia and they write this pattern in it, they better put Sapungus' name right beside it. The little out and the curl back into the middle of the field once he catches it. He's made a living on that pattern. Calgary leads it by one with 3.05 to play in the fourth quarter. Get ready for one of them finishes. Stampeders slot machines. Alan Pitts with nine for 115 today. Dave Sapungis has only three catches but he has a touchdown. However, Alan Pitts has taken over the receiving lead from Sapungis. First and 10 for the Stampeders. From the 24, quarterback draw by Flutie. Flutie lost the room, and he gets inside the 10, down to the 9-yard line before he's finally stopped by Roosevelt Collins. And Collins thought he came up with the football, but they ruled that Flutie was down on the play. Well, this is a design play, and they do it in the red zone when they get down there. You're getting pressure from the outside, so they run the quarterback draw. Flutie finds his way through that offensive and defensive line. And then the question is that Roosevelt Collins stripped the ball out, but Doug Flutie's knees were definitely on the ground. 13-yard gain for Flutie takes his team to the 10-yard line. Doug Flutie, by the way, is 123 yards away from 30,000 in his CFL career. He become the sixth player in CFL Time history out. to pass for 30,000 yards Calgary. in his career. And it would be astounding if Doug Flutie were able to do it in this brief a time. I mean, it's only a matter of time now. Yeah, and we were talking about those slot backs that he's throwing to. And you know, when you look at the projections for Alan Pitts and Dave Sapunjas for 1995, Pitts gets 2,034 yards, 18 touchdowns, and his buddy on the other side, Sapunjas, 2,000. 46 yards and 12 touchdowns. And just his sixth season in the Canadian Football League, Doug Flutie is already in monstrously elite company. 29,872 as of this moment. I mean, he's going to start looking at passing guys like Dieter Brock pretty quickly. He figures he's two years behind Matt Dunnigan. You know what? When you look at that list, if you continue that list to top 10, six quarterbacks are playing right now in the top 10 all-time yards. First and goal just inside the 10. Flutie's in trouble, throws it up to the corner, and it is caught by Vince Danielson. Touchdown, Calgary. Woo, what a grab by Danielson. That was perfect coverage by Bobby Humphrey. 
and Vince Danielson just stretched it out for his third touchdown catch of the year. Right, you saw Bobby Humphrey in the end zone shaking his head and putting his hands up in the air because you can't do any better than that as a defensive back. Flutie rolls, throws with pressure all around him again. Somehow he gets it off and watch the catch as Danielson leaves his feet completely. You'll just see it at the bottom of your screen and Humphrey's right there. Humphrey right there, he can't make the play, but wow. What a catch by Vince Danielson. Oof. A heartbreaker for the San Antonio Texans. Mark McLaughlin on for the point after. It is good. And the Calgary Stampeders lead it by a score of 38 to 30 with 2.17 to play. What a grab by Vince Danielson, the second year man out of UBC. And you know, Danielson has a couple of touchdowns. You know, Pee Wee Smith, we talked about earlier, doesn't have a touchdown with these stamps. Danielson has a couple. Well, watch him lay out, concentrate, and bring that one in with Humphrey right beside him. I mean, that's the type of thing where Flutie goes and says, hey, I put it out there, but what a great grab by a receiver. He's saying, hey, my arm's still sore. That by elbow way, is killing him. And look at Vince Danielson. Oh, sure. He is pumped up, and so he should be. And there's Humphrey. And that's the one where Humphrey goes, looks at the game film, and he says, hey, he gets paid, too. He's a professional, and he made the play on me. Is that what you used to say? That's what I used to say. <laughs> he gets paid, too. Hopefully you don't say it too much. <laughs> well, Doug Flutie never saw Danielson catch that pass. He was facing the other way, protecting himself. But it's a five-play, 61-yard drive. We talked about how Flutie... We'll take time off the clock, 2.37, and Vince Danielson caps it off with a 10-yard touchdown reception. Here's David Lucas from the 20, got by the first man, got up to the 35. Now, 2.13 to play in the fourth quarter. The people in San Antonio may not know the league very well, but if they did, they'd know there's all kinds of time for San Antonio to go to work. Oh, there's all kinds of time. You can score three touchdowns in two minutes. I mean, people here used to the American League. They're used to people walking out in the two-minute warning because the game's over, but not in the CFL. It's lots of time for Kemp. We talked about his composure. Let's see what kind of composure he has because you know Calgary's going to be sending some pressure at him. As Dan Peters have allowed just six points in the second half. True to four for Calgary. Now, Kemp stands in. Gets the pass out there for Billy Hess, but it's incomplete. And Anthony McClanahan, the linebacker, was there on the coverage. And that was just a case where Kemp didn't get him the ball because Hess was open on the sideline, but Kemp one-hopped it to him, so... Jimmy Kemp's just 23 years old. He's got a bright future. This is what stars are made of right here. From the shotgun on second down. Four-man rush by Calgary. Lots of time for Kemp. He stares in. Oh, he got caught. Mark Stockton threw, but he hung on. Right in the midfield. Oh, man, did he get in. Well, this play is great all the way around because Jim Kemp does a nice job of hanging in the pocket. Stock doesn't get open till late. And, of course, the safety. Greg Knox is reading. Kemp's eyes comes across and lowers the boom on Mark Stock. You see those Nikes straight up in the air for Stock, and he hangs on. A 20-yard gain. Now Kemp trying to add to it. Has a man. No, oh, he doesn't make the catch. Kittrick Taylor out of bounds as Kemp tried to follow up one big play with another. Wow. Yeah, that one was right down the sideline. It would be close to see whether or not he was pushed out, but the refs think that even if he didn't get pushed, he wouldn't have uh, Kemp come in with his feet inbounds. But Kemp's throwing under some tremendous pressure by Stu Laird coming off the corner and hanging in there. And let's see. No. No. He's out of bounds. A good call by the official. Second down from midfield. 152 to play in the fourth quarter. San Antonio trying to force overtime here. Kemp up over the middle, has a man, it's Billy Hess, and Hess is brought down the 37-yard line. He's tripped up by the safety, Greg Knox, who unloaded on Mark Stock a moment ago. Yeah, but Calgary runs a little bit of a different type of defense on Kemp. They're going to drop Dreko Zizakovic. You'll see him number 96 to the top right. Now, he's not a linebacker and doesn't know what to do in that instance. Can't break on the ball like a linebacker can, and Kemp recognizes 
misses it and finds the open man. Saw that last week against Baltimore. Now Kent stands in. Looking over the top. Ken Leonard almost picked that off. They were looking deep for Billy Hess, and Hess had to play defensive back there as Kent Leonard was the closest man to the ball. Now, 133 left. One thing to think about for San Antonio, if you do score, don't leave too much time on the clock. Well, no, I mean... You don't want to give Flutie another chance, but still, tremendous pressure on Kemp. You see oh. Big Daddy Marvin Pope coming up the middle late on the Reed Blitz, and Kemp's taking a few of those hits after he throws the ball, and he's been under some pressure, but hanging in there with some good poise. Second and 10 from the Calgary 37. San Antonio needs a touchdown and a two-point convert. Kemp, here comes the rush. Underneath he goes for Saunders. Saunders has a long way to go, and he's driven out of bounds with a flag down the end of the play. And it looks like face masking will be the call against Calgary, because Wally Buono is up and arguing. I think you're going to get face masking on Alondra Johnson. That was his responsibility was coverage because Calgary had come with the safety blitz with Greg Knox. Major foul. called for face masking. Huge penalty at San, San Antonio to the Calgary 17. Now, Alondra Johnson is in charge of trying to cover Mike Saunders, and he just gets the hand, that left hand on Saunders' face mask. It was a close one, but it, it was enough to pull Saunders' head. It was Alondra Johnson, not Al Jordan. First down from the 17. Camp, here comes the rush. Trying to get away, he can't. Kenny Walker drops him. Back at the 24-yard line with 1.20 to go. And Kemp is rushing, and he has lots and lots of time, and he did a good thing there. He didn't throw it away into coverage. He had lots of time initially. Walker gets the late late rush on him, and instead of throwing it away and having a bad interception, he hangs on, takes the sack. Now he's got another chance. Kenny Walker from nearby Crane, Texas. Now second and long. Kemp in trouble again. Scrambling away, but nowhere to go. And he is dropped by Stu Laird, among others. And now it'll be third down from the 20. Dreco's a little tired on that sideline. Hopefully he's just got a bit of a cramp or trying to catch some air. And this will give time for Jim Kemp to come over and talk it over with Kay Stevenson on the San Antonio sideline. A minute five left. So realistically, kicking the field goal is not an option. No, not with Doug Flutie in that offense. You know they're going to get at least a, uh, one first down when they get the football. So this is it. You got to go for it right here, and you got to get it in the end zone. Actually, right now, San Antonio doesn't have to score to get the first down. They just have to get it to the five-yard line. They've got all kinds of time. And Jim Kemp is in there talking it over. David Archer will have some input as well. And Sreko Zizakovic is getting that right arm checked. And when they do the grip check like that, it's usually a stinger. It sure is. That's usually when you get that hit on the shoulder and you get some nerve problem. It sort of makes your whole side go numb. You can't really feel anything in your arm and that side of your body. And it slowly comes back after a few minutes. But what a game Zizakovic has had. And a couple sacks so far this year. But he has been in that San Antonio backfield all game. And you see him get in there on the tackle. And... He was down low. It sometimes doesn't take a whole lot or a big hit to get a stinger. Just have to be hit at the right spot. You know, I'm sure on that sideline, Kay Stevenson has told Jim Kemp, listen, we can get the first down. There's Bob Vespasiani, the defensive line coach. He was telling me that he has quite interesting meetings. You've got the Zizakovic brothers who ride Harleys and have tattoos. You've got Kenny Walker who's deaf, so he writes out jokes to people. You've got Stu Laird, the union rep, who watches the clock to make sure the meeting isn't going too long. Mark Pierce is from England, talks like a London Bobby. And through it all, at the back of the room, you've got people like Marvin Pope. Just cracking jokes a mile away. He says, I don't have to run off to join the circus. I coach it. <laughs> Here it comes. Third and 14. Not much of a rush. Now Kent's under pressure. Scrambles away, but he's got a long way to go. And Kent will not get there. Stopped at the 15-yard line. 
a good eight yards short of the first down. And with 39 seconds to go in the football game, that will do it for the San Antonio Texans who go down hard against the Calgary Stampeders. And I tell you, this is really just inexperience in a young quarterback. Jim Camp had to get all those yards, and he's not going to get it running through the whole Calgary defense. And then when he gets caught, might as well throw the ball on the ground and caught, just deliberately fumble. Hopefully you recover in first down territory. But he's had, a, he's had a good football game and just in a situation where he had to throw the ball downfield and didn't do it. And that'll go down as the third turnover of the football game for the San Antonio Texans. But what a fight San Antonio put up against the undefeated Calgary Stampeders. They sure have, and they did last year when they were Sacramento as well. They always played great against Calgary, and they really felt like they could control this Calgary offense and, and beat this team. Doug Flutie, bat, elbow, and all, got the job done for the Stampeders. And now Flutie will just run around and try to take some time off the clock. You'll want to watch. He doesn't take too hard a shot. And that's not what Wally Buono wants to see, is his million-dollar quarterback getting whacked at the end of the play by Jason Wallace. Well, you wonder why you wouldn't have Doug Flutie sitting on the sideline. But with the ball on your own 10-yard line, and it's this close of a football Time game. Out. You don't want to make a mistake and have a guy who's cold off the bench come in and take those snaps and have a fumbled snap. But for Doug Flutie, you don't want to take those hits if you don't have to. He needs to just kneel down and get it over with. And Wallace is the injured player for the San Antonio Texans. But as of yet, he has not received medical attention. He may be asking for it yet, but so far the trainer hasn't made his way on the field. And it's Flutie as well at the Calgary bench. He's getting some attention, as he does. We'll remind you that Paul Mazzotti and the Toronto Argonauts take on the BC Lions, who are looking on with interest today. And I'll see Calgary go to 6-0, or 7-0, rather, on the season. BC will try to run its record to 6-1 on Monday. Paul Mazzotti's had some problems this year, and... Trying to get back to form. 7-1. 7-1. Sorry, right. sorry about that, Vancouver fans. I forgot the BC won earlier this week. Against the Saskatchewan. Nice. And flags are down. So he might have taken too long to put the ball in play there, but the clock should have started after that last play. Now, this gets interesting. It's procedure against Calgary. There's 32 seconds left. I mean... Now it gets into a really interesting point because San Antonio can call timeout. Yeah, and if Calgary loses the down here, they're going to have to punt it. Well, now Flutie may have to throw the ball. This is this is getting a little more interesting than the Stampeders would like it. And I believe it's the right tackle, right there, Bobby Pendelitis. It moves. Nine. Still second down. It's Rocco Romano, number 59, not 69. So Rocco Romano for procedure. Now 34 seconds on the clock. It's second down. 17 yards to go. The Stamps are at their own eight. So Flutie takes the ball, runs around, and takes the safety. How about that one? Yeah, he might. But then touchdown wins it for San Antonio. That's right, but you have to kick off after the safety. Now Flutie, going to try to run around, but he won't give up the safety. He's down at the four-yard line, dropped by James King. 31 seconds left. San Antonio will almost assuredly call timeout. Well, now what you do is get Tony Martino back there and take up, the, uh, give up the safety, or you leave Flutie in. He takes it back and gives up the safety, and then Calgary kicks off to San Antonio from their own 40. So it's a uh... now. Did San Antonio use a timeout earlier in this half? They must have because they're not calling one here. See, San Antonio has their punt return team in, but they don't need to because Flutie's going to take this ball from center and just run around and give up the safety. He's got only four seconds to get the ball in play. He does. And you're right, Flutie will give up the safety. Oh, one of the San Antonio goal miners got clocked in the end zone. Six seconds to play. And Flutie gives up the safety. So now the Calgary lead is 38-32. There's a flag down. That might have been a clip. 
Now the flag is out at the 18-yard line. Wolf, this gets interesting. You'll Watch see it Dingle. right here, right on Dingle. Now that's close. I mean, Stepan just has his head on the upfield side. I don't know if that's really and that great a call. but And now a meeting in the end zone with the flag down. What is the call? We'll get it from Jake Ireland. Too many men. San Antonio. Oh. Repeat third down. Too many men on San Antonio? Oh. Well, it didn't really matter. With six seconds left and the safety given up by Calgary, there wasn't a whole lot of chance San Antonio had to come back in this game. Still, now Calgary can run off the rest of the time on the clock because the safety doesn't count. It's third down over again. And Flutie will just run around and kill the rest of the time on the clock. So had they not had too many men on the field, San Antonio would have gotten the ball back and perhaps gotten one chance to take a shot at the end zone. Better than no chance at all. Yeah, they would have had the Hail Mary opportunity, but wow. as it turns out, they won't even get that chance. Too many men. What a costly penalty. And here comes Flutie. All he's got to do is take two more seconds off the clock. Doug Flutie has left the building, folks. <laughs> He'll head straight to the locker room with another win for the Stamps. <laughs> the Calgary Stampeders move to 7-0 on the season with a 38-32 win over the San Antonio Texans. Calgary is 13-0 against U.S.-based teams and remains the CFL's only unbeaten squad. Calgary wins it by six. We'll be back in a moment. We have bottles in use now that we purchased almost 20 years ago. We are one of the few companies left in all of Canada that still bottles in a returnable, refillable glass bottle. Well, we're in a very competitive industry, so it's always a challenge to keep costs on. The Advantage Savings Plan has enabled us to do that. Our average long distance would run $130, $140 a month, and our Advantage Saving is $60 to $70 a month. In a small company like ours, it adds up. It is substantial. The Canadian Football League 1995 Facts, Figures, and Records Book. It's your source for the landmark play, the vital stat, the award-winning players, the complete rule, and the outstanding performances all the way to the Grey Cup. To order your copy, call 1-800-667-1251. Mr. South, fresh thinking is what we are. Tonight's event is brought to you in part by Trojan Condoms. Welcome back to CFL Control. The Calgary Stampeders get the job done. They improved to 7-0. and oh, The San Antonio Texans really threw a scare into them. They fall to 4-4 four and four on the year. The big deal, the Stamps outscore the Texans 23-8 to eight in the second half. We had an inkling they were going to come back, and they did just that. Allen Pitts, another big game. Lucas with the 105-yard punt return for the touchdown, and Alondra Johnson with a 20-yard fumble return. Our next game comes to you from Skydome on Monday, BC Lions will take on the Argos. It is a 7.30 start Eastern time. That'll do it for now. Thanks for watching. We now join this week in baseball in progress.